Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to welcome you to NHF's fourth annual Victor Griffles Rora Medical Pre-Conference -con pre Symposium on Bone Health and Pain and Bleeding Disorders. This is generously brought to you by Griffles. This year's uh, Griffles Medical Symposium will focus on our current research understanding of bone health and inherited bleeding disorders. We'll review the pathophysiology of bone disease, highlight the results of study on bone health and hemophilia carriers, and individuals with DWD and discuss pain specific to hemophilia and other bleeding disorders. We'll conclude with a talk on physical therapy and its use in, ma in managing hemophilia related joint issues and pain. With me virtually today is Emma Hatcher, who is the head of patient affairs at Griffles. Um, she recorded a few words for us we'd like to share with you right now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak for a few minutes today. My name is Emma Hatcher, and I'm the Global Head of Patient Affairs for Griffles. I haven't had the opportunity to meet most of you yet, and I'm appreciative to be able to join today, even if it is virtually, for this year's Bleeding Disorders Conference. I very much look forward to a time in the near future where I can join some of you in person. Before I hand over the reins, please let me thank the foundation for all of their support over the past two years during COVID and for walking alongside us as we continue to work to ensure that plasma collections return to pre-pandemic levels and that we're able to meet the needs of all the patient communities we serve. We are so grateful to you for this partnership that we've shared for over 20 years. And my uh, additional final thank you is for a group of folks that are not actually here today, our plasma donors. Each year, hundreds of thousands of people donate their plasma so that our medicines will be there when it's needed for patients around the world. Griffles is a family company that began in 1909 in Barcelona, Spain. The vision and leadership of this company has been back passed down in successive generations of physicians and pharmacists. A few years ago, Victor Griffles Rora, for whom this symposium is named, stepped down from the CEO role and now serves as the chair of, chair of the board of directors, and his brother and son now serve as co-CEOs of the company. It is this family name, legacy, and commitment to patients that continue to inspire and motivate the next generation of employees such as myself. So finally, welcome live and in person to the 2022 Victor Griffles Rora Symposium. Thank you. Thank Griffles for their continued support and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the planners for this year's medical track, um, Dr. Pipe, Dr. Dunn, um, Dr. Corteau, and especially Dr. Chitler who has been instrumental in bringing the symposium and these excellent speakers together. Unfortunately, Dr. Chickler is unable to join us in person today um, due to an unexpected medical situation that's made it difficult for her to fly. Uh, she sends her sincere regrets, but we are also fortunate to have Dr. Gupta, who has graciously stepped in to moderate today's symposium in Dr. Chickler's place. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Um, uh, Dr. Gupta is a professor of uh, medicine in the Department of Medicine Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of California, Irvine. Um, her main research interests include pain, vascular biology, as well as molecular mechanisms underlying the tumor microenvironment and pain. Her work is focused on the mechanisms of pain and pain therapy with opioids, cannabis, and evolving novel therapies. Uh, she's led a pioneering work in understanding the mechanisms of adverse effects of opioids on cancer pain, leading to cancer progression, and laid down the foundation of understanding the mechanisms of pain and sickle cell disease. Dr. Gupta is also the recipient of the Excellence Research Excellence in Research Award from NHLBI to examine the potential of cannabis uh, to treat pain and develop methods to, to quantify pain objectively. She has served as an advisor to the SCD program at NHLBI NIH and received the Power Award or the Pioneer Award, I'm sorry, from Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Gupta to the stage. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Spitali, for the very kind introduction and uh, also to the organizers and especially to Dr. Chitlur for inviting me to actually moderate in her place. Uh, these are big shoes to fill. And so please pardon me for any um, oversights I might have uh, as I'm new to the program here and we are trying to develop 
uh, strategies and mechanism-based targets for hemophilia pain. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce the three very expert um, uh, hematologists, uh, pain researchers, and physiotherapists, a great team of physicians and scientists to this session to highlight the need for and the understanding of bone and pain uh, disease associated with bleeding disorders. First speaker will be Dr. Jason Taylor. He's an MD-PhD physician scientist. He has been involved in bleeding disorders throughout his career, and he has led the adult hemophilia program at Oregon Health and Science University for eight years from 2010 to 18 and has supported the Alaska Bleeding Disorder Clinic from 2010 to present. So he divides his time. His academic research has focused on understanding the mechanisms of hemophilia-associated bone disease. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Divya Sitla, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. She is a pediatrician hematologist with research focus in hemostasis and thrombosis. She has specific interest in bone health in patients with bleeding disorders. It's a difficult specialty to find actually amongst hematologists. Uh, so really I admire her um, courage to do that. Dr. Sittler received the Marion B. Leon New Scientist Development Award in 2021, which is a two-year grant to investigate the mechanisms of bone loss associated with hemophilia, hemophilia carriers, and von Willebrand disease. Our uh, final speaker is Dr. Jessica Nikki Clark. She has a PT, DPT, and TPS uh, degrees, and she's a faculty instructor from the University of Colorado in Denver. She's newer to the bleeding disorders community, but she brings a unique perspective with a background very much needed in bleeding disorders, which is in acute and chronic pain management. Nikki earned her doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and she is a certified therapeutic pain specialist through the International Spine and Pain Institute. Her subspecialties include pediatrics, limb loss, and limb difference, and chronic and complex pain syndromes. Her current research interests include pain education, very much needed, pre- and post-operatively for persons with bleeding disorders and exploring virtual reality interventions for pain rehabilitation. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Taylor to come and present to the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers. And uh, I appreciate everybody can ever hear me okay? Um, small groups, if you have questions, feel free to heckle. I'm used to it. So uh, it's a blast from past. I see a couple of people from before. I've been uh, I've been kind of away a little bit. So I appreciate that. So I am employed by now. I work for a pharmaceutical company. But I am still volunteering at the Alaska Bleeding Disorders uh, Clinics. So I, but, um, I have no conflict of interest at all with it, but just for full, full disclosure. So to hop right in. So I'm going to review things from my perspective, historically from my perspective in my lab. Um, and so I'm not going to hit everything. I'm just going to hit, I think, a pretty good story, though, regardless. So anyway, several studies have demonstrated bone disease and hemophilia, including children, right? And it's been thought, what, um, and if you, take, well, if you take a look at it, you can look at different levels of bone disease. But if you want, really want to look at it, it's 70% of patients or uh, p persons with hemophilia have some form of bone disease, 30% normal and 70% abnormal. If you look at bone mineral density uh, analyses of, of all these studies, you can see it's present in adults and pediatrics. It's not specific to adults at all. So the problem is these studies are all observational and numerous confounding um, variables. So and generally thought to be secondary to you know low physical activity, recurrent hemothrosis is also viewed could be associated with hepatitis C and HIV and other chronic illnesses. Our hypothesis, this is going back over a decade now, is that decreased bone health in hemophilia is a result of actual factor deficiency. These other things sure play a factor, but I think but, but our thought was a factor deficiency in and of itself causes bone disease. 
so, so first thing we did was there's no real data on fracture rates. Uh, there was one small case controlled study uh, that was, really wasn't very effective at it. So we, so we actually went back and looked when I was at OHSU and looked at fracture rates over 10 years. And so, uh, and of all of our patients. And, uh, and the fracture rates is actually pretty striking. Black is expected uh, historic controls. And you see a little spike. The little spike happens in adolescence. If you, um, and then our spike happens a little few years after adolescence. It makes sense. People a little bit more adventurous later on. But, uh, but, you, can, but you can see there's a significant difference in bone disease between, um, between the red line hemophilia and the black line the controls. So there's something going on here. So what is it? So, we, so we, then we looked at the f types of hemophilia. So we, we looked at hemophilia A and hemophilia, hemophilia B, and both of them appear to have um, increased uh, fracture rates compared to the general population. And if you look at severity, it also seems to be a dose effect. The more severe, um, the more fracture, the higher the fracture rate, although these are small numbers, but still it, um, it sets up interesting hypothesis. So, so this is observations. So we took these observations and went to the lab bench. And so we looked at my mouse models of hemophilia A, and that means we, we take the mouse, we move the factor eight gene, and, and we uh, take a look at what's going on. So we, ha I had the, we have the unique ability to do lots of different studies on bones in my lab and my collaborators. So we're able to really look at, look at this in quite, in quite some detail. So these mice are, are a knockout amount of factor eight knockout mouse and wild type mice look the same. They act the same, look the same. So we looked at peak bone mass, which in a mouse is, is, is 20 weeks. So about one week per, per, per year of human time. Um, and, we, and, we, and we did analysis of it. So before we do go too much detail, what is, what is, what is bone in general? Right? So we all know what bone is, but there's, but there's uh, sorry, it hits me in the head. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> no, it's fine. If I blind you, I'm sorry. It's part, it, this is what's necessary for this. No, I'm sorry. So. All in the name of science. So anyway, cortical bones, the hard bone on the outside, trabecular bones, the soft stuff inside, kind of support tissue. Um, and both of them are critical for the integrity of the, of the bone. And then quickly, osteoclasts. You have osteoclasts on this side, which, which cause bone resorption. And you have osteoblasts on this side, which causes lay down. It's kind of, it's kind of like coagulation. There's always, there's always some on, there's always some absorption taking place, always some some uh, bone laying taking place. It's just a mechanism of sometimes more on or more off. So anyway, um, that's just a quick summary of that. So then, we, so then we looked at, we took these mice and actually looked at them. And so bone mineral density. So what is, we, everyone talks about and studies bone mineral density, but we, what we have to realize in bone mineral density is that's not an endpoint. That is a, that is a marker, right? This is a marker for bone disease. We don't fracture, kid, we don't fracture people's legs and see how strong they are, right? But, but we do bone mineral density as a marker of it. So, when, so bone mineral density, again, is a marker of bone disease. It's not the fun, it is not the endpoint of, of, of bone disease. So you have to remember that when everyone talks about these studies, they're using it as a surrogate marker. So anyway, so, so, so we so looked at these mice, and they have um, whole body. Uh, there's a trend, which is also complicated by factors of whole body and lots of issues involved with that. But if you look at the, look at the femur itself, there's significant bone disease, I mean, I mean bone mineral density differences in, the, in these knockout mice compared to wild type. Okay, well, that's interesting, right? That's just a marker. Well, let's look at a little more details. We took a CT, a CT scan. This CT scan, by the way, is about the size of a bread box. So it's about this big. The bone mineral density thing's about this big. So, you, so, so everything's on micro scale. So we had a little micro office. Anyway, so, but just, so anyway, so we have this little thing going on. So you can see, there are differences even in cortical thickness. Again, the hard outside is thinner. Even though the bones have the exact same displacement, same exact size, the structure of the bones are different. So that's interesting. So then we, so then we actually went in more detail and actually took the bones and actually saw how, how easy it was to fracture them. How hard, how hard is it to take to break them? And the ultimate force is, is how much force, obviously. And it's, a, it's stiffness. We have strength, we have modulus, which is elasticity. All these things are fundamentally different between the knockout mice and the wild type mice. So these bones, even though they looked identical, are, are functionally very different. So then we looked at the stuff in, in between, the trabecula, the, the, the soft stuff. And what we found out here is there's less of the support tissue um, present, 
And then we looked at, uh, then we actually looked at osteoblasts and osteoclasts. What we found out is there's three times more osteoclasts in these, in, in these bones than wild types. So there's increased bone resorption taking place. This is a surrogate mark for bone resorption. Three times more cells that are involved in bone resorption present in the knockout mouse of the wild type. So clearly there's, there's something fundamentally different about these bones. So our conclusion is these mice have bone disease and um, it's not due to any of these other comorbidities. These mice did not have HIV. They didn't, they didn't do all these other things. So something associated with, with factor eight deficiency that led, led to it. So then the question becomes, what are the mechanisms? Well, what is it? Well, it's a specific to factor eight. So we did the same thing in factor nine mice. And just to go, I'll go in this a little less detail, but we did both during growth, which would be a pediatric population, and we did it at full growth, which would be an adult population. And we looked and we did the same things. And you can see bone mineral density actually was different even at 10 weeks. So, you, so, so these, these kids, equivalent of what a kid would be, have bone, have bone mineral density differences. And it's also the case present in a uh, larger. So then we did the bone, so we did the same thing with fracture, and you see differences showing up even early on at 10 weeks. So again, there's something going on even very early. Structurally, there's differences as well with, uh, with, the, um, with the cortical bone. We can get into um, what these things, what these cross-sectional axes mean. But the functionally what it means is that these bones are, are structurally different and weaker. So then they also then look at, we looked at, we did micro CT looking at the trabecula again, showing differences as well. Um, down, uh, well, actually no differences here, but differences at 20, at 20 weeks, not showing up yet, but they show up at later time points. Part of this is 10 week old, um, 10 week old mice and just like kids um, develop slightly differently. And so some of the differences might not show up until the bone, bone maturity. So, but regardless, I think it tells the story um, that there's differences in, in these bones. And then we looked at something called, uh, so, so the rank ligand OPG pathway is a, is a conical pathway. It's, it's the pathway that the osteoblasts tell the osteoclasts what to do. The osteoblasts say, tell the osteoblasts what to do through this communication pathway. Oh, uh, this thing, rank ligand, binds on the rank and causes these cells to be activated. OPG blocks that interaction. So having alterations in this rank ligand uh, OPG pathway leads to differences in, in bone. And you can see, um, even, even at 10 weeks, we had some, we had some di differences present. Uh, those levels are low, and it's hard to detect here. But clearly, by 20 weeks, you see differences in the rank like in OPG, arguing that there's some, something wrong with the signaling between the osteoblast and osteoclast going on. Um, we, can, we can hand wave what that would be, but I think what the important thing is, there are these differences. So, so factor deficient mice, uh, factor eight and factor nine, both have decreased skeletal health. And, it's, and, and these, they, these mice weigh the same as wild type. Do all, this is no reason for them to have decreased bone mineral density. Uh, we, even did, we even did studies saying that the activity is the same. We put a little running pads and counted how many times they took steps in a 24 hour period. All those things are the same. So, so, so really all these changes is something fundamental physi physiologic difference based on the factor deficiency. So then what about von Willebrand's mice? Because there's been arguments that von Willebrand's might be involved in this bone disease. Um, any guesses on the results? You're welcome to, to guess anybody who knows about von Willebrand's in mice. But von Willebrand's is a little bit different actually in mice. So there's no evidence of bone disease. And, and, and what makes it really interesting is these von Willebrand deficient mice, so type three von Willebrand's functionally, they still have factor levels. So I say 20%, but it's actually closer to 30%. So these mice have still have factor eight present at, at, at appreciable amounts, but they have no von Willebrands. So it appears that von Willebrands is, is not part of this, of this pathway. And, uh, and it also argues that even, uh, you don't have to have normal levels of factor, that even uh, 20, 30% factor levels might be enough. Although clearly it was a small study, but still, I think numbers were, um, were quite impressive of how normal they were compared to um, wild type. So implications. So factor deficiency shares a, a similar phenotype, likely a, a, a similar mechanism. So what can the mechanism be? They can be lots of things. They can be cytokines, thrombin, even at APC, and even uh, hormones. People have been arguing that PTH is involved. I'm not do, I have not done the research, and I have not followed up on the, on the hormone studies. But um, 
I've been following up on the on the ones listed here. So now I'm going to go a little nitty gritty, but this is actually interesting. This is I have pictures for you. So it's and, and you know pictures are worth a thousand words, right? So so what we did we, we took we took the precursors of osteoblasts, grew them in tissue culture, and, and saw what happened. And what's interesting is, so these are factor deficient mice, and these are wild type. So at 12 days, and it's reproducible, at 12 days is very little of this calcium being formed by the osteoblasts in, in, in deficient mice, whether it's normal, well, compared to normal, which is wild type, even at later time points, you can see differences. So then, okay, that's interesting. So factor deficient mice, then, okay, so, but what, the, the meteorite span is even more interesting. If you give mice factor, then you take out the, these, these osteoblasts and grow them. You have wild type, you have knockout, so you have differences. But then if you add the factor back to the mice before you do this, it goes back to normal. So if you replace factor immediately prior to taking them out, or 24 hours prior, you correct this. It's interesting. And let me give you another slide that's even more interesting, I think. And this is, if, it, if I give, if I take it out and immediately give factor to tissue culture, same thing happens. So you have, you have knockout, then you add knockout with factor eight added in tissue culture. So adding factor eight to factor eight knockout osteoblast makes MAC more normal. Interesting. But factor in tissue culture is probably not going through the whole co coagulation pathway, although you can because these are, these are grown in mouse serum. So it's, um, um, but it's interesting. So giving back factor even to the cultures do something. So something fundamental about factor deficiency uh, uh, leads, to, leads to these outcomes. So why, what does this mean? Well, how do we translate this in? Uh, knowing the mechanisms help, uh, uh, tells the impact of therapy and, and what's going to happen to these patients in the future. So role of factor replacement, role of higher troughs or higher peaks, and role of these novel hemoph uh, hemophilia therapies on bone health. Not, um, so hemolibra would be, would be a great example. And it's also interesting for general populations, our big trans anti, it's or anticoagulant. And, and, and it binds thrombin directly. And that's how it's anticoagulant, but if it binds thrombin, maybe thrombin, if thrombin is involved in, these, in bone disease, it may be causing bone disease in patients to give anticoagulation to it, because these patients go on it for 20, 30, 50 years because of the fact they have atrial fibrillation and other things lead to that. So it's interesting um, potential. So, 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 okay, so we went from the bench back into, back into the patients. Okay, so, so we went from the patient's observation into the lab. Now we're taking this back out again. And so we went, Marilyn Manko Johnson in our, in our group um, has, has these bio, has a biorepository. So we took, so we took, um, from patient, we took 80 patients, um, blood from 80 patients from hemophilia A, 20 from hemophilia B, and we made sure that there was no recent ble bleeds and no, and no HIV or hepatitis C. So we took a relatively clean population and took a look. And here are the results. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit. The blue line, um, the, the, the green is, is under 16 when you have, uh, um, before you have maturity of the bone. So we just look at bone maturity. You see that rank ligand and OPG again, just like the mice, are different. Just something different about this path, uh, communication pathway. But it's really interesting, CTX1. CTX1 is involved in bone resorption. So when you resorb bone, CTX1 gets released. Um, it, it's, it's a collagen thing that you can pop off the end, the C-terminus of collagen, and it just becomes available in, in the bloodstream. So as you break down, as you break down blood, I mean break down bone, you get more CTX1. So Bone absorption is happening. Now, what's really interesting, we take the CTX1 and look at it in detail. Um, so you can see there's a difference here, 0.5, so there is a difference. But then if, you get, if the patients had factor within 24 hours prior to this test, uh, prior to a blood draw being drawn, they're normal. The p-value is 0.54. So there's no difference between those and, and that got factor and controls. But if you didn't get factor, the p-value goes up even higher. So patients that got factor just prior to this blood draw, their CTX1 levels are, are normalized. This is arguing, uh, granted this is a, a, a not a prospective randomized trial or anything, but this is arguing or giving a hypothesis that factor replacement may ameliorate bone disease in hemophilia. So it's, it's, this is really interesting. And this, I finally got, we finally got around to publishing that last year actually. Um, we presented it several years prior. 
So, um, so it's really interesting. So, so, bio, so, so maybe the biomarkers in bone disease can help. So we know in pediatric population that there is an association with bone mineral density and some markers. We can talk about that in more detail, but just that thing that what needs to be known is that. And also the biomarkers be used to differentiate between undertreated hemophilia population and the general population. And, and, and the differences seen in both, uh, and, and, but these differences of, of biomark is seen both, uh, the, well, the problem here is it's hard to differentiate between bone disease and joint disease. So bone disease was talking about how much mineral there is. Bone disease, um, joint disease is, is, is a destruction of the joint. You can see that there can be a problem there. So can we can biomarkers develop at risk different um, at risk uh, individuals and can we differentiate between joint and bone disease? Um, it's just hard because they have the same pathway. They both involve collagen and the collagen break, breakdown. We know that collagen is a component involved and that factor eight knockout mice, the collagen in their joints uh, are different and is exacerbated by bleeds. So and this and this has been confirmed in, in the humans as well. So, so, so how do we different? Is this just, so there's been people trying to correlate MRR findings with biomarkers. The problem with that is if you have an X-ray or an ultrasound or a whatever imaging you want, if it's chronically done, biomarkers are not good for that. We know biomarkers are good for a couple of days, but they're not so good for a, a decade or two, right? So. There's no, they didn't see any correlation with MRR findings with biomarkers. That makes sense because I think it's the time scale is different. So, I, but anyway, so a hypothesis of future activity is was for me at the time, factory placement um, is critical for proper uh, proper health. What is the, What is the common denominator for factor eight and factor nine? Well, at the time, I thought it was thrombin. Thrombin makes sense. Oh, how am I doing on time? By the way, I, I, I forgot to bring my phone up. I'm doing great. Okay, I know I can I can talk all day, or I can go. I'm here all. I'm I'm I'll be in Vegas next Tuesday, folks. So uh, but anyway, so but but moving along. So so I thought thrombin because you know what, fact what what fact factor deficiency. Well, factor deficiency originally was scientists said were a low thrombin state. If you go back to the papers in the, in the first part of the, of the 20th century, they identified hemophilia as being a low thrombin state. They didn't know about factor eight versus factor nine, all that. They knew it was thrombin deficiency. The problem is um, thrombin deficient mice are lethal. They don't live. And even, even conditional ones do not live. So we can't, but we do know that thrombin communicates to osteoblasts and osteoclasts, those two cells, involving um, PAR1. So PAR1 is just a protein, protease activated receptor. It's just a receptor. This receptor is activated by lots of different, it's a family receptor. They're all activated by different proteases and thrombin happens to be one of them. And so thrombin act and PAR1 is present at high levels in, on osteoblasts. So the hypothesis would be that PAR1 deficient mice may have differences. So we actually looked at that. So we, again, clinical observations back to the bench. We took out, we took out, we, we took PAR1 knockout mice. They looked the same as some regular mice, same thing. Everything looked great. And guess what? They have bone disease. PAR1 mice have bone disease. Therefore, it's thrombin, right? Well, not so quick. I then took PAR1, uh, took PAR1 knockout mice, the same mice, but these could not be activated by thrombin. So thrombin could not bind them. If, and these mice were normal. So PAR1 is important, completely important. PAR1 knockout mice, mice. So something about the signaling of PAR1 that causes bone disease. But it's not through activated, but not through thrombin. Maybe it's through activated protein C or other things. So that's why I stopped. Actually, that's why I stopped. And so I identified those bone disease present in factor deficiency. I identified those, those present in a pathway that's associated with signaling of of, of the clotting cascade. But I didn't, I didn't actually um, complete the dots before I stopped my research um, um, doing that. So anyway, this is and I have a lot more detail, but I'm not going to get into it. So the conclusion is, bone health um, is seen. In, uh, decreased bone health is seen in he, in hemophilia, and decreased bone mineral density, which again is a biomarker. But what really matters is the fracture rates. If people break their legs or break their hips, that's the problem. Bone mineral density is not the problem; it's the fractures. But, it, but again, both of them are altered. Understanding mechanism is necessary, both for diagnosing as well as treating these patients. What's the role of what's the role of bone mineral density of factory replacement or factor troughs? What is the role of these new uh, of these new um, 
uh, novel agents. So uh, Rebecca Custeros at, at, at in Seattle is starting up a study right now on uh, Hemlibra looking at bone disease um, over time in these patients. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be an interesting study um, and we'll see how that goes. So, so if you guys are interested, contact her if you're interested in being involved in that bone disease um, study. So, and, and so that's it. Uh, my next, what if, so again, I asked the questions already. What, what, what are, what's going, what is the fundamental cause? Can we identify biomarkers? And can we find a way to ameliorate this disease in hemophilia? So that's the end of my presentation. I, was, I, I, I wanna go not in too much detail because I wanted you guys to get the main points. But um, I'm here right now, and so I was going to do question and answers. I'm going to the airport immediately after my talk before the, the roundtable. So curious if anybody had any questions based on this, or, or were you guys just wow? This has been like the this is like the highlight of your week, hopefully. So it is mine actually. The, well, it was the highlight of my decade, I guess. I had ten years doing this. So uh, a bit open the floor to any questions. Wow, that was a terrific presentation yeah, on a very difficult subject. It's open for. Uh, discussion and question and answers while you are getting ready. Yeah, I, have a uh, I have a question. So did you, you did the bone scans, mineral density, uh, was it done only at 20 weeks and or at lesser age? Oh, did you uh, see uh, the differences? Oh, oh, well, in factor nine, we did at both ages. Okay. We saw differences. Has, I, I didn't do in factor eight, factor eight, we focus on mature bone, but I did in factor nine look at, look at it. So it, the, the differences are in both structure and bone, bone mineral density is already evident at 10 weeks. And did, did you or anyone ever try giving bisphosphonates because uh, if there right. is bone uh, health involved, would right. that help? Right, that's, that's a good question. And you, you don't get bisphosphonates to growing bones. So, so once one of the problems is it's already present by 10 weeks, which means I, we didn't give it to the mice, but we were arguing if we should and, and do force lavages and all that stuff, and we were not into that. Um, but um, the answer is, for me, because it's present early, I don't know if this phosphate will help at that point. And later on, are, are differences going to be, can you, can you ameliorate worsening of disease at 20, um, later on? Great question. We didn't do it. I, I, ran, I had too many questions to follow up, to follow up that one. Good question, though. Yeah, and go ahead. Um, I didn't look at calcium levels, to be honest with you, but that is such a, uh, other things like alkphos and other things are much, are much more sensitive, and there are some differences there. I used to go through that data, but, um, but, but there's some evidence of increased bone turnover caused by those markers. But yeah, um, the most sensitive ones would be looking at bone-specific ones, but yes, we did look at it, and there is some differences. And there are some differences, I didn't get into it, but there's also differences in cytokines, both in mice and in humans. And if cytokines are involved, that involve, um, it becomes a little bit complicated how that works, but we have several, uh, several cytokine differences that are consistent with, again, increased bone turnover. I have one last question while audience is warming up. <laughs> uh, hey, if you're not warmed up now, I don't know. How to... So talking about uh, thrombin, Mm -hmm. and PAR1, because these protease activated receptors are in many flavors, PAR1, PAR2, PAR3. Yeah, it's, it's, PAR, and, it's PAR1 through 4, and, yeah. and two of them are present in platelets. And, and so hematologists know them because of involvement in platelets, and the PAR receptor ag antagonists are used for bleeding, for, for bleeding issues as well. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I was wondering if you looked at other proteases, like so many serine threonine proteases, right. which act via PAR2s, PAR3, PAR4. Right, right, right. And they're very sort of present in a lot of cell types from the nervous system to the vasculature to the immune cells. Oh, right. So PAR1 and PAR2 are the only ones present in osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So the, uh, and thrombin does not involve in PAR2 at all. Uh, the one I didn't look at, which I really want to look at, was activated protein C. So the only ones that are really involved, primary or secondary, in a client cascade would be would be thrombin or activated protein C. I mean, we can, um, the other ones are nonspecific and would not be involved in the clotting cascade. So I've only, so the one I, I wish I had looked at was APC. They have APC deficient PAR1 bindings, but they're really hard. Those mice colonies are really hard because of the lethality of, associated with them because APC is necessary for development. So um, the answer is no, but I would have loved to have done it. 
like to pick your brains and you're mm -hmm. leaving, so we'll yeah. have to do it now. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, is, is, is there neutrophil or mast cell or granulocyte activation in the joints where there is bleeding or, you know, where, because most of the injury occurs in the femur. Uh, well, somewhere there. Right. So, so you're asking about immune cell recruitment or, or what's happening at the joints. I didn't, I didn't study that, to be honest with you. I, I would defer to some other experts on that. I, I apologize. I don't want to go down that pathway because I only know part. I only know part of the story. Because they release so. a lot of proteases. They release a lot of it, in proteases, and it's proteases. The breakdown of the joints is caused by. I mean, blood causes the breakdown. It's not blood causing breakdown. It is the immune response leading to it, which is exactly what you're saying. So I agree with you very much. So, so. Well, 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 that's ultimately the question, right? We don't know what these novel therapies are doing. That's partly why they're doing this bone health uh, study um, is, is exactly that, is, 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 it a, is if it's involved in thrombin or APC, is there enough thrombin? APC, Hemlibra generates 20% thrombin, right? Is that enough? And so from the von Willebrands, it might be enough. In studies, it might be enough. We don't know. And the other, the one part thing about the Hemlibra study is that, we're starting from the time point of the hemlibra. So it's gonna take it's gonna take several years to determine the impact of hemlibra or factor for that matter. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a tough study uh, in the first several years just because it's I think we'll know in 10 or 20 years, but <laughs> sorry about that. Nothing sooner. Oh uh it, it, um, Bruno, right in the over. Bruno can wave. His, you can talk to Bruno right there. He's actually running the study with uh, Rebecca uh, Cruz Jaros, who's the head of the HTC in Seattle. But Bruno, can you stick around to talk to her afterwards? <laughs> Thank you, man. Appreciate. <laughs> anyway, he also gives great hugs. So uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks everybody. Anything else before we end yeah, this section? Yeah, Dr. Taylor. We have a question in the virtual space. Ooh. Are there any studies on bone health on kids that have factor eight deficiency? Yeah, so I showed the I showed the yeah. first I showed the first few slides to show that bone mineral density is um, decreased in children with hemophilia. So and so and that's actually been reproduced. And that was a meta study uh, involving four studies in uh in children and it's pretty reproducible that they that they all have they have um, decreased bone mineral density and actually in our study and pediatrics we also had increased fracture rates in, in our in our center in patients with hemophilia thanks um the ones that in my center i didn't look at that i just took it i, I was trying to review all the all of our records going back 10 years was it was fun enough without looking at it. I tried to get that information, but I gave up at some point. Because how many, how many, how many of you patients on Profi are on Profi? I don't <laughs> Welcome to hemophilia. I hope you learned something over the next <laughs> Anyway, anyway, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I read papers about OTG and one being Right, it's that one paper, and that one paper completely misinterprets their own results. I'll get to it. I, if you want, you and I can talk about it later. But okay. well, <laughs> because because they were, anyway, yeah, I, I can go over that paper. That paper just irks me because it's like they, they, didn't, they didn't know their own science. So um, if you look at the actual, go through details of what they did, it doesn't actually say that. But even so, OPG would not buying on von Willebrands does not explain factor nine deficiency and does not ex, doesn't explain par one deficiency. So I think there's a common denominator. I don't think it's OPG buying onto von Willebrands. The other thing to consider about patients with von Willebrands is they're undertreated and, and by nature people who aren't treated well have increased levels of bone disease because as you know bleeds in, in and of itself is an independent factor for osteoporosis due to the high inflammatory states caused by it. So anyway, so I think. Yes, but I don't think it's OPG. We got one more yeah. um, in the virtual. If thrombin is the key step, then it doesn't matter if patients get non-factor therapies. Your thoughts? Well, that's a question. We don't know, right? So, so, so if you take, if you look at PAR one knockout mice, it argues thrombin. But PAR one knockout mice that you can't bind thrombin, they still uh, they don't have bone disease. So something. So, so there's something about. 
that pathway that's involved, they may not be thrombin. And if it is thrombin, I don't know what levels of thrombin is necessary. So I think that's why this study being done with him Libra is, is critical saying, is bone disease stabilized with, with him Libra? And that's, and that's an unknown question. That's why I think this is really an important study. And uh, that's why I appreciate that. Hi, by the way, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hepatitis is hepatitis is not a great disease to have, and uh, in of itself, it's a risk factor for bone disease. And so you have so these older patient populations, or patient populations who are you know, on what forty over forty now, the, um, they have three risk factors. They didn't take factor because they're alive. So if they took if they were compliant back in the eighties and nineties, they wouldn't be alive. Most most of them, most of them have. But still, the ones that are alive, they oftentimes have hepatitis C and or HIV, and they have ter and they didn't take factor very much. So those patient populations, really hard to discern what it is. So I think it's a multifactorial for those patients. I think HIV, hepatitis C, inactivity, bone disease, all of that, I mean, joint disease, all that's combined to, that's why, that's why I thought I got a headache thinking about it. I went to mice. <laughs> My, no, I'm saying, Humans are more important, but mice is easy. They don't have HIV. They don't have hepatitis. Yeah, exactly. One one question, one answer. So anyway, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And also, I'll send my email. Well, actually, yeah, I, if you have questions, um, um, I'll be happy to address by email, and we'll talk about you, which email later. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful start to the great session today and wish you a very safe flight back to Anchorage and hope to see I you next time. I am taking Alaska Airlines, so I'm going back to Seattle. Oh, Seattle. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Uh, with that, we will go to the next talk by Dr. Sitla, and we have already done the introductions. Uh, here she is. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I um, guess I have to pull my slide up first. Did somebody there do it or? Sure. How's it going? <laughs> well, I'm Divya Sitla. I am uh, from uh, uh, I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas, um, at the HTC at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. I'm a pediatric hematologist and uh, primarily working with hemostasis thrombosis and bone health is one of my research focuses. So we'll talk a little bit more about it. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> Right, I know. All right, um, I have no disclosures. So um, today we'll talk a little bit about bone health and bleeding disorders. Dr. Taylor has given a great introduction to the topic. Um, we'll talk about the results of a national database study and what the clinical implications are and what, what are the current screening guidelines for bone health in patients with hemophilia. So poor bone health is common and costly. Um, Osteoporosis-related fractures are about one and a half million individuals per year in the United States. It's a major public health problem, and it's a huge financial burden to the country, about $18 billion spent each year on osteoporosis-related fractures. We talked in detail about uh, bone health and hemophilia. Um, for those of you that came late, we know that severe hemophilia A and B and moderate hemophilia A and B, um, there are several animal studies, clinical studies that show there's decreased bone mineral density, there's increased risk of fractures. Um, in mild hemophilia, we do know that there are some clinical studies that show that there's increased risk of fractures, uh, not many looking at their bone mineral density. What do we know about bone health in hemophilia carriers? Um, 
we do not have published studies looking at fractures or osteoporosis in these patients, but we do know that they have musculoskeletal issues and joint bleeds. Uh, one study showed that hemophilia A carriers have subclinical joint bleeds all the time uh, with bone and soft tissue changes noted on MRIs. Um, Dr. Sidonio's group showed that hemophilia A and B carriers um, have reduced range of motion in joints in joints when compared to historical controls. So uh, this is something that needs to be studied further in this group of patients. Uh, bone health in one Willebrand disease, there is one abstract from a national meeting a couple of years ago that shows that there's decrease, uh, increased rates of fractures, osteopenia, and osteoporosis. But again, there's definite evidence of musculoskeletal issues in this group of patients. Um, joint leads are seen in about 45% of patients with severe von Willebrand disease, and about 40% of these have arthropathy, so which is pretty similar to moderate hemophilia, and there are several musculoskeletal issues. So how is bone health affected? Um, there's two extremes, right? One, there's fear of trauma or bleeding. Patients are leading a sedentary lifestyle. They have poor musculature. Or patients having recurrent bleeds have poor mobility and therefore poor musculature. And we briefly discussed earlier about chronic hepatitis C and HIV. There's an inflammatory state. Liver is affected. Um, and this goes on to affect bone remodeling process. So what is the bone remodeling process? Um, there's five phases. There's the resting, resorption, reversal, formation, and mineralization. The two cells that we always talk about when we talk about bone remodeling are osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts help bone formation, and osteoclasts help in bone resorption. And there was an excellent presentation by Dr. Taylor. Some of the references in here are his papers. So um, we know intrinsic factor eight deficiency um, is important. Thrombin deficiency, thrombin receptors play an important role. So thrombin generation could be the answer for all this. Um, this was the question I asked him about OPG. There's one paper which talks about um, OPG um, at OPG is known to be an anti-osteoclastic protein. And there's this paper which talks about OPG and von Willebrand factor being co-localized and co-secreted from the levopelate bodies. So uh, if there's low levels of OPG in circulation in diseases like in a disease like von Willebrand disease, then could that be one of the reasons for osteoporosis? So this led, um, I'm a clinician, not a basic scientist. So this led to a question um, if other bleeding disorders have similar uh, poor bone health. So we hypothesize that persons with von Willebrand disease and hemophilia carriers have a higher prevalence of bone health issues when compared to the general population without bleeding disorders. So the aim of our study was to assess the prevalence of bone health issues among persons with von Willebrand disease and hemophilia carriers, specifically to look at osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and bone fractures. We wanted to compare the prevalence rates with the general population without a bleeding disorder and compare the prevalence rate of risk factors between these bleeding disorders and the general population. So we used a, a commercial database called Explorus. It has about 72 million unique patients from 26 healthcare systems uh, from 1999 to 2020. We defined controls as general population without von Willebrand or um, hemophilia or hemophilia carriers. Uh, cases for von Willebrand disease were both males and females with von Willebrand disease. And for hemophilia, uh, for hemophilia carriers were females with hemophilia or hemophilia carriers. So these are our results. We'll first look at hemophilia carriers. This database, about 72 million patients, we identified 940 hemophilia carriers and about 38 million female controls. Um, if you look at the age distribution, oh, I need to learn how to use this. Um, the age distribution, um, majority of the patients in the study were over 18 years of age. There were fewer pediatric hospitals in this, and majority of patients were Caucasian. Next, we'll look at the bone health outcomes. The first one we're looking at is osteoporosis. Uh, the blue is controls and the orange bar is cases. So compared to controls, cases had significantly higher prevalence of osteoporosis. Uh, the same thing with osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, higher prevalence among cases, and fractures, higher prevalence among cases. We looked at the relative risk, and um, the relative risk of osteoporosis in hemophilia carriers was 1.8, osteoarthritis was 2.4, and fractures was two. So definitely, overall, poor bone health in hemophilia carriers based on this. 
Then we went on to look at what risk factors did these patients have. So we picked the risk factors that were most commonly reported in hemophilia papers and that were identifiable in our database. And we looked at vitamin D deficiency, obesity, hypothyroidism, smoking, diabetes, hypocalcemia, corticosteroid use, malignancy, NSAID use, and renal failure. Every single risk factor was more prevalent among hemophilia carriers when compared to controls. To sub-analyze this a little bit more, um, we next looked at controls with osteoporosis and cases with osteoporosis. And we compared um, these risk factors and to see if there was any difference um, in their prevalence. And for osteoporosis, the four significant ones were vitamin D deficiency, smoking, hypocalcemia, and malignancy. Uh, we did a similar thing with osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and the significant ones were, again, vitamin D deficiency, obesity, smoking, hypocalcemia, and a couple of drugs, corticosteroids and NSAIDs. Same analysis for fractures, and it was pretty much the same list uh, with the addition of malignancy. In summary, there's higher prevalence of osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and fractures in hemophilia carriers, and there's higher rates of risk factors for poor bone health. Next, we'll look at results for von Willebrand disease. So among the same 72 million patients, we found 19,580 persons with von Willebrand disease. We separated them into males and females. Um, there were 5,100 males and 14,480 females um, with von Willebrand disease. We also subanalyzed them for age less than 50 so to take out age as the confounding factor uh, for, for these bone health changes. So you'll see four bars now. The first two are males, the second two are females. You see that grid there. So um, age distribution, majority, again, were over 18 years of age. Majority were Caucasian. First, we looked at osteoporosis. As you can see here, both males and females, uh, case, there, were more, there was more, the prevalence of osteoporosis was higher among uh, von Wilburn disease. Next, we looked at age less than 50, and the prevalence was pretty high again in both males and females. And if you look at the first graph, um, prevalence was much higher in females in age greater than 50, but almost comparable in um, less than 50 years old. Um, the relative risk was definitely high, um, but age, 50, age less than 50, the relative risk for males was 9.4 and females was 5.1. So significantly higher. Next, we looked at osteoarthritis, similar findings, high uh, prevalence in both males and females in age less than 50, and the relative risk was pretty comparable for all ages. Next, we looked at bone fractures, um, high prevalence for, for um, both males and females when compared to controls, and um, fractures were not as common. Sorry, guys. Uh, fractures were not as common in um, males. I mean, the relative risk was not as high in males less than 50, but everything else was pretty comparable. Um, next, we looked at every risk factor, and um, every risk factor was more prevalent in von Willebrand disease than controls. I didn't feel the need to put a table here because it would say exactly the same thing. Um, next, we looked at... Uh, the similar sub-analysis to what we did for, uh, one, uh, for hemophilia carriers. Here, for osteoporosis, hypothyroidism, corticosteroid use, and NSAIDs were significant. And in osteoarthritis, I'm sorry, on osteoarthritis, um, pretty much all of them, except a couple of risk factors, were all more prevalent in cases with osteoarthritis when compared to controls. And for fractures, um, every risk factor was higher and more prevalent in uh, one Wilburn disease when compared to controls. In summary, there's higher prevalence and relative risk of osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and fractures in one Wilburn disease, and higher rates of risk factors as well. There are several limitations to this study. This is a database study, so the exact accuracy of the diagnosis cannot be ascertained. No information of how these people were diagnosed or how what diagnostic criteria was used to determine them to be osteopenia or osteoporosis or one Wilburn disease is not known. But this database has been used by several researchers across the country, so we, it, it is accurate to an extent. 
what are the next steps and what do we need to do next? So um, I have an ongoing study with the CDC Joint Outcomes Group where we're looking at the community counts data set and going back and seeing, uh, looking at all, all bleeding disorders, hemophilia, hemophilia carriers, rare bleeding disorders, von Willebrand disease. So hopefully we'll have those results soon and we'll have more reliable results than a database study. Um, we have a prospective study at uh, the Arkansas Center for Bleeding Disorders in Little Rock where um, I have a grant to study ble um, bone health in hemophilia carriers and von Willebrand disease where uh, we're doing DEXA scans, we're doing PQCT and blood and urine markers similar to Dr. Taylor's study. But there's definite need for more prospective studies and to analyze this further um, at this point. But while we're waiting 10 or 20 years to figure out how and what we're going to do, I think it's important to prioritize bone health um, in, on, in our everyday clinics. Um, I feel vitamin D is an easy answer, like we can all check them with our routine comprehensive visits. Um, and in fact, in our center, we started doing this when I started um, at um, Little Rock. And for the last two years, when we started off, almost every single patient was vitamin D deficient. And one year later, I think less than 25% are now vitamin D deficient. I don't have the exact numbers, but we see a significant difference in their vitamin D deficiency, and it's an easy fix. They do. If, if there are patients that don't want to take vitamin D, there's actually something called a STOS protocol that you can do in clinic. We've done that for a few patients that say, I don't want to take pills. So we have done that for a few, and that's been really helpful. We do that for our sickle cell patients, too, and they love it. Um, and... I think it's important to review medical problems. As uh, hematologists, a lot of times we focus on their bleeding disorder, their bleeds and medications, and we forget to ask if in the interim have they developed a new systemic disorder that could increase their risk of having uh, bone health issues. So identifying risk factors should be key. Um, what are the current guidelines for screening patients or hemophilia patients with DEXA scans? World Federation of Hemophilia says uncertain if they need routine screening for osteoporosis may be appropriate in persons with hemophilia who are at high risk or have multiple clinical risk factors. British guidelines say regular osteoporosis screening for um, hemophilia patients on antiretrovirals and use the FRAC score to determine if they're at high risk. Australian guidelines say they should be routinely checked in individuals in a manner consistent with local guidelines. But if we don't pay attention to the risk factors, we'll probably not identify these patients. Um, but what are the general guidelines? What are the local guidelines or the national guidelines for us? In men, there's insufficient evidence according to the US PSTF. So there are no specific guidelines according to this um, to screen men. And for women greater than 65, um, postmenopausal women, you they need screening with the DEXA. But, Less than 65 for postmenopausal women is based on the clinical risk stratification tool, the FRAX tool. There are several guidelines, and everybody is pretty consistent. Age more than 65 for women, um, age more than 70 for men. If less than 65, then you need to look at their risk factors. This, again, underlines the fact that at every visit, we should be paying attention to the risk factors that our patients have. This is the clinical risk determination score that they are talking about, which is the FRAC score, uh, which is primarily used in adults. We don't use this in pediatrics. And the FRAC score page has a list of secondary causes for osteoporosis. Um, you can see the list. This does not include bleeding disorders. This does not include hemophilia. But we have plenty of studies at this point to say patients with hemophilia have low bone mineral density, um, leave alone carriers and von Willebrand. I feel like at least hemophilia should be on the list for secondary osteoporosis for us to consider. But because it didn't make it to the list, um, there are issues at times to get insurance authorization for these patients to get a DEXA scan. And we have to go through prior odds to even get this done. So at our center, we have formulated a screening tool. Um, this is a QI study that we're doing. Um, we do patients from, we see patients from womb to tomb, so children and adults, and we have the screening tool. And so we're looking at age, we're looking at risk factors, uh, we're looking at health conditions that increase risk for osteoporosis and medications that increase their risk for osteoporosis. And for hemophilia alone, if they're, even if their age is less than 50, between 40 to 49, um, if they have one greater than one target joint, we plan to get a DEXA scan for them. And because of insurance issues and things, we, we plan to refer them to endocrinology and they would do the DEXA scan the same day they see them. So in the next couple of years, we'll see what we find and hope to have better screening.
if any of you would like to collaborate with me and do this at your center, I'm happy to send information and we can do a huge multi-center QI study. Um, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> So the endocrinologist will decide if we need to do an intervention or not based on the analysis. We thought we would start. I'm a pediatric hematologist, so I am not comfortable <laughs> doing that. Uh, but we, we have a team. Uh, there's a pediatric endocrinologist and an adult person that I work with, and um, they will be helping decide that part. Yeah. I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Ahuja and Dr. Sidonio, who have been my mentors since fellowship and extremely helpful in guiding me through this. Um, and my amazing team at um, Arkansas, um, some of them are here today. Uh, thank you for being here and supporting me, and um, they take such good care of our patients. Any other questions for me? Very wonderful presentation. According to this program that we have, we have questions and answers at the end of the three talks. So everybody can collect their questions and answer them Sounds good. at the end. So with that, thank you so much for that amazing talk. And with that, I think I will start my presentation with you and, uh, as I, and I think we'll be changing, shifting gears a little bit. We'll have more pictures. And so it will be kind of an intermission from very powerful, knowledge-filled hemophilia presentations and uh, bone health. So I'm sure by now, with these uh, outstanding presentations, all of you are experts in bone health. So we'll go on to pain. And I will discuss pain pathobiology in hemophilia and other blood disorders and a critical need to understand and treat it. And uh, it's not moving. Is it controlled from there? Turn around. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, right. Okay, thank you. These are my disclosures. Um, thanks to Griffles also who are here. Uh, now, what is pain? This is best described in this picture by a very talented artist who happened to have homozygous sickle cell disease. And when we ask anybody, how do you define your pain? It's usually on a visual analog scale, on a numeric rating, one to 10. And 10 is the highest. So he named this art that he produced 10 redefined. And he described it as what the pain of sickle cell disease feels like for me in this painting. I wish to inspire empathy and compassion in others so that we may someday end the suffering of the sickle cell community worldwide. And to this, I would add, our goal is to someday end the suffering of those with bleeding disorders on the whole and the blood disorders. With that, in remembrance of Hertz Nazair, who created this powerful rendition of pain, which we cannot forget, I would like to remind all of us about the hidden hurts in hemophilia. This is very well depicted, actually, very recently last week in an ASH clinical news paper. And in several talks at THSNA last week, there were presentations and a session which showed that almost or more than 50% people with hemophilia and bleeding disorders report fifth pain in the past six months. And of those, 28% reported anxiety and depression. So it's not just pain, it's all those associated conditions that come with it, which feed into it and then paid feeds into them. And therefore it is important to treat it what is the treatment? For now, for severe and chronic pain, opioids are the cornerstone. But are they a problem or panacea? Because we have known for a long time that they cause all these conditions, sedation, constipation, etc., for which we have been trying to develop alternative therapies like opioid-induced constipation using, um, using three drugs based on opioid receptors. 
and then others. But in the last few years, the opioid deaths have caught the nation by grief. And also, NIH has fast forwarded its agenda to develop new targets and new therapies for pain treatment without the risk of addiction and the liabilities associated with opioids. So we had all been listening, talking about cannabis. Now, is that the solution or a problem? Again, this was very well represented in this ASH clinical news that 89% of patients had a 50% reduction in depression just after 20 minutes of cannabis use. But then what happens on the long term? The baseline symptoms of depression gradually worsen over time. So this is not solving the problem. So how can we reduce pain? So far, in spite of four years of billions of dollars worth of grants from NIH, I don't have an answer for you. So what can we do? What should be the strategies? Now, why has pain? We have developed factors for hemophilia. We have developed gene therapy. Why has pain remained on the back burner? Because as we just heard that, you know, if a, it is a hematologist would think of the hematologic problem, blood disorders are hematologic disease. So they think of the disease factors were developed, but pain goes behind the burner. And now we are realizing it. And that is why we haven't been able to develop anything other than opioids till date, which can be effective. So the three strategies that I came up with was that first we have to prevent pain at its source from being evoked. So what is the connection? You know, a person who is normal and walking around doesn't develop pain unless they get hurt with somebody, something. But people with some chronic conditions like hemophilia, blood disorders, they develop pain. So how does this disease process cause pain? Can we break it there from act actually taking it to the nervous system? The second is, can we treat pain once it is evoked? Now, nervous system has been wakened up and it's activated. And the current, and for that, we need to develop analgesics. And currently, we have opioids, and you just heard we can't give NSAIDs because they weaken the bones. Uh, so, there is really no solution yet. And then the third is perception modulation. And I think Nikki is going to talk some about it. Um, that can we target the brain and top-down spinothalamic system, something with, with, to do with mind, body, CBT, hypnosis, virtual reality, et cetera. Now, what do I mean by all these? This is very complex and very different from the bone health we, we talked about. So as an example on which we have done a lot of work and others have done a lot of work is sickle cell disease, particularly related to pain. And it's a disease caused by these, by the change in one, just one amino acid in the globin chain, where glutamate is replaced by valine. And look what it does. These round shaped, donut shaped red blood cells, which move like the tires of a wheel and the car keeps moving, they actually become sickle shaped. And if we make a tire sickle shape, what will happen? The car will not move. As a result of which they block the traffic. That is, we call it log jamming. And they will clog the blood vessels, as a result of which the powerful work of the blood vasculature is to supply nutrients and oxygen to different organs. And that is stopped. And when that is stopped, there is worst kind of pain known to mankind. This is how it is described. It's called due to VOC. It can be unpredictable. It can occur anytime. It can occur many times. People have to be hospitalized, and it reduces their lifespan. So this is really, really sad that now. So we wanted to know how this little change in just one amino acid causes this whole complex system to be activated and leading to pain or nociception. This was a big question mark for us. And all that happens in this condition is a lot more than just a sickle red cell. It causes mayhem. There is sickle adhesion to the vasculature, as I just described, log jamming of the cells. Then there is cell-free heme, 
coming from the hemolysis because these red blood cells keep hemolyzing because they do not mature, they are sickled. As a result of which cell-free heme permeates the whole microenvironment, they get out of the blood vessels. There is hypoxia, there is ischemia reperfusion injury, inflammation, oxidative stress, vascular dysfunction, organ damage, chronic wounds, vaso-occlusion. Any one of these can actually activate the nerve fibers. Why? Because they are everywhere, just like the vasculature. And anything that goes near them will activate them. So how does the system work? Why do we care about it? So here is this system, and this is the reason that we have not been able to develop efficient therapies, either as analgesics or disease-modifying agents, because this is very complex. So for the last 12 years, my laboratory and then many others have been working on how sickle cell disease, these features, actually activate this nervous system. And what we envisage is that these nerve fibers, which are in the periphery, also in the in the other central nervous system parts, they get activated by these inflammatory cytokines with cell-free heme, et cetera. And when they get activated, they transmit the signals to the neuron body. So, you know, neuronal system is very interesting. It is a neuron body is, is like an octopus, except that it only has two arms. So this neuron sitting here, the octopus sitting here, sends one fiber down into the periphery to the organs to the skin and one fiber up to the spinal cord and this is how it is very efficient in transmission and amplification so once the signals activated these are uh, these are carried or transmitted to the drg or dorsal root ganglion which houses the primary neurons here they are amplified and these action potentials then go to the spinal cord and from the spinal cord, they synapse with the neuron, the nerve fibers coming from the ganglion here, and, and, they, and they transmit the signals to the brain, and the brain perceives the brain. But brain is a very smart organ. It is very powerful. It, it also has its own system of controlling pain. In addition to what is happening here, it can actually override this effect through the spinothalamic pathway and send signals to the spinal cord to neutralize this. It's called the gate. And then there are many other cell types here, glial cells, which are the macrophages of the central nervous system, interneurons, which also get activated. And then the whole orchestra participates in it. Now, when there are signals being transmitted regularly, what happens is we may not need the signals to be sent. We may stop them here. We may develop targeted therapies and we may stop them here. But the chronic pain may persist. Why? Because this system becomes self-sufficient. And there is an antidromic release from the central nervous system of these inflammatory cytokines and neuropeptides like substance P and CGRP back to the periphery. So it becomes a monster. It becomes self-sufficient. And we cannot just modify this chronic pain by targeting the primary condition. And this can happen with, say, gene therapy or transplant that is being carried out in sickle cell disease that the chronic pain sometimes doesn't go away because these nerve fibers are either injured because of this chronic uh, injury or noxious insult, or they have, there is this whole system which is sensitized and transmitting the, the signals in an antidromic manner. So what we did to, to find out how, and to reach what I showed you is that we used the transgenic mice, somewhat like what Dr. Taylor described for factor eight knockout. These mice do not have a knockout, rather they are transduced. We, this, uh, some of the very smart investigators at UC Berkeley and in University of Arizona, they created this difficult mouse model over 10 years of work where they transduced the genes for the human sickle hemoglobin in these mice. So these mice, when they are homozygous, can express more than 99% human sickle hemoglobin. And at the same time, just to take care of the transduction and all the reagents that went into them, they prepared a control mouse, which expressed normal human hemoglobin A. 
So we could then compare what is happening in these. Now, these mice are exceptional, exceptional in the sense that they express many hematological and pathological features of the sickle cell disease, including our laboratory characterized them that they develop chronic mechanical, thermal, and musculoskeletal hyperalgesia. And this is this musculoskeletal pain which brings us close to the bleeding disorders pain where the skeletal system is affected. So what we found, I won't show you the data, but with these pictures, uh, I hope, if, we, if you believe me, uh, that pain increases with age in these mice. Females show more pain than males. Uh, the facial features show more pain, like in children, we try to do uh, the visual uh, expression and, 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 and create a score. And then they have central sensitization, which means that the pain has become chronic. And they show mechanical, which means they're very sensitive to touch. So they have hypersensitivity to touch. It is so much so that even when there is wind speed, if it increases, the people with sickle cell disease and the mice, their pain increases. We kept the mice in the room, the ones near the door, when the door opened, the draft killed them. They are that sensitive. Heat, they, they are very hypersensitive to both heat and cold. And, and cold is a very classic example of sickle cell pain. They are extremely, extremely sensitive to cold. And then they have this deep tissue musculoskeletal pain. This is worse. What happens is, as the hematologist friends tell me, that after they have a VOC, they are hospitalized, they can go home, but this deep pain doesn't go away for months. Sometimes it lingers on for more than three months. And then after we characterized these mice, with these features and tests, uh, which were quantitative, then the same tests were then developed subsequently in patients for doing quantitative sensory testing for mechanical, thermal, and deep. For deep tissue, we haven't done yet, but for these mechanical and thermal, they have developed quantitative sensory testing. And also based on M fMRI, Dr. Darbari, at Washington uh, uh, University showed that they have central sensitization, uh, the patients as well. So this just shows us that these mice replicate not only the features of pain in sickle cell anemia, but also have, uh, uh, have, uh, have potential to then examine further the pathobiology of pain because the pathobiological features of the disease are also the same. So what we did was, the first thing was, we wanted to look at the gene signatures of pain in the sickle cell disease. And this is a database we published in Nature's Scientific Data. Anybody can access it. Um, and what we found was that multiple genes were analyzed, several thousand. And what we did, oh, this was for you. So <laughs> you finished early. Uh, that was nice. So we, we divided the mice into eight groups. So we took the control mice and the sickle cell mice. Then we divided them into younger and older. Younger because then they won't have central sensitization or chronic pain. And we wanted to see what happens with chronic pain. And then we further divided them into normoxia and hypoxia reoxygenation, which is to mimic a, and create a model of VOC, vaso-occlusive crisis, or when they have blockade, blockade of blood vessels and they develop this unpredictable uh, pain for which they are hospitalized. So under all these eight conditions, we analyzed the data, and lo and behold, what we found was that only two genes were actually significantly downregulated and early on. So even if we induced hypoxia reoxygenation, nothing happened. And these two are SPRR1A and serpents. So one is involved in nerve regeneration and cornification, and the other is a, an inhibitor of proteases. And you heard from Dr. Taylor about thrombin, which is a protease. And that is why I asked all those questions. Uh, so what is SPRR1A? It's a small proline-rich protein. It's a cross-linked envelope protein of keratinocytes, and it forms an insoluble envelope beneath the plasma membrane. And what is important is it's regulated by proteases. So, and 
it forms the cornified epithelium, which is the outermost layer of epidermis, and it's formed of several layers of about 20 layers of cells with organelles and cytoplasm, and it's filled with filamentous keratin. So what keratin does is it forms a sort of a plastic layer so that the skin is not so sensitive to many stimuli. I, I tap this, my, I don't hurt because my skin is protecting it. It's not that sensitive. And, and it prevents exposure of underlying tissue from infection, dehydration, chemicals, and mechanical stress. And notably, in sickle cell disease, it's a disease of dehydration. And they get recurrent infections. And ever since um, the invent of penicillin and giving penicillin to children in many countries, the survival rate has improved. And keeping skin hydrate, and it keeps skin hydrated by preventing evaporation and also it absorbs water. So it prevents dehydration in multiple ways. And then it's involved in axonal regeneration. So if we have nerve injury, this gene can be protective. But what? This is not there. It is downregulated. So there is no prevention, no, no repair. And what are serpents? These are serine protease inhibitors. Like they will inhibit proteins like thrombin. And it's, it's a murine ortholog of human alpha-1 antichymotrypsin, and it's an alpha-globulin glycoprotein. It's encoded by a serpent, serpent A3 gene in humans. We are looking at mice, but it is also encoded by the serpent A3 gene in humans. And it's downregulated in degenerative conditions where there is axonal injury, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Most importantly, relevant to sickle cell disease, it inhibits neutrophil cathepsin G, elastase, and mast cell kinase, platelet activation and aggregation. And some of this may be important for bleeding disorders like hemophilia. And in sickle cell disease, we and others have shown that there is increased mast cell activation and neutrophil activation. And then a, a publication in 2015 showed that the serine protease inhibitor serpin A3N attenuates neuropathic pain by inhibiting T-cell-derived leukocyte elastase. So elastase can be released by multiple leukocytes. They found it in lymphocytes and in sickle cell disease, elastase is released by neutrophils. And what our lab did was, here is a picture. We showed that mast cells release tryptase and interact with cutaneous nerve bundles in sickle cell mice. This is a real picture from the skin of sickle mice, which we co-stained with the nerve fibers here in blue, with mast cell tryptase, which is a protease just like thrombin coming out of them. And then these are the granules and parts of mast cells all over the place. They should not be like this. Mast cells are tight cells, but when they are activated, it, this is how it is. And you can see here that this nerve fiber is being chewed up by the striptase here and here. And the striptase is sitting in this nerve plexus. So it's disturbing the nurse nerve plexus. So, so this can, these proteases can directly cause nerve damage. And you can see here, now why is it that these proteases are released? What is causing the release of these proteases in sickle cell disease? So as I described earlier, there is hemolysis, cell-free heme. So if we take the mast cells from sickle mice and we incubate them with heme or hemin as it is called in the test tube, then they start releasing these extracellular traps. It's like a bombardment. So the cell gets hyperactivated. And there are many ways that mast cells can act, get activated. And this is the worst kind. And they form traps in which they can entangle the nerve vessel, nerve fibers, and blood vessels. So not only a chemical, but also physical injury by these components of mast cells. And that's what I showed in the previous one. Now, how does it impact pain? What is the connection molecular basis? And we discovered this over a, several years. I won't show the data, but this cartoon shows it, that tryptase released from mast cells activates the protease activated receptor 2. Now, Dr. Taylor very nice, uh, elab nicely elaborated upon PAR1, 
which one on uh, which was on osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Here on the nerve fibers, it's protease activated receptor two, which coactivates the capsaicin chili pepper channels, also called TRPV1. And together they start releasing all these chemicals, which are injurious from the nerve fibers, calcitonin G related peptide, substance B, and they are both inflammatory as well as vasoactive. And what they do is they cause arterial dilatation and increase venular permeability, and, and they can cause neurogenic inflammation and swelling and pain. And then this substance P can go back and reactivate these mast cells. So these mast cells then do not require this heme to activate them. They become self-sufficient and very powerful. And this again act adds to the chronicity of pain. And so what else we found was that the elastase activity was increased in the plasma, lungs, and DRG of sickle mice, as seen here in the purple lines, as compared to controls in the green bars in all three organs, which means it is not just restricted to the nervous system, but it is also a peripheral impact and something that could be happening in many bleeding disorders because there is heme coming out because of bleeding. So in, in a nutshell, what we hypothesized and what we believe is happening here is there is downregulation of serpents and increased proteases in sickle cell disease, which may contribute to the pathogenesis of pain. And I showed you that how mast cells and neutrophils are activated, releasing proteases, including tryptase and elastase. And then the transcriptomic analysis showed that these mice have significantly decreased expression of serpents, which can counterbalance the proteases compared to the control mice, and, and that we observed increased elastase activity in the dorsal root ganglia compared to control mice. And this paper that I cited, the serpin A3, or this inhibitor of proteases, can attenuate neuro, uh, neuropathic pain in different models of mice. So what we did was there is a natural Serpin, alpha-1 antitrypsin or prolastin C, which is made by Griffles. Uh, they were very kind to provide it to us to experiment on our mice. Um, and it is an alpha globulin, just like I described. It's a serpin. It's an, an, it's an endogenous protease inhibitor. It inhibits proteases, including neutrophil elastase, mast cell tryptase, platelet activation and aggregation. And it's clinically used in hereditary severe alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So we used it in the mice, and what we found was that a continuous intraperitoneal injection every day of 200 milligram per kilogram really attenuated pain in sickle mice in the blue lines here you can see. Uh, so a uh, 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 lower value here is higher pain, and in this test, a higher value is higher pain, which is written. So a lower value is higher pain, and, um, and we see that these mice have pain because the value is low. And when we treat them with alpha-1 antitrypsin prolastin C, their pain decreases over a period of time, over seven days, without developing tolerance. So this has potential for translation. Circulating alpha-1 antitrypsin and elastase or protease activity may be potential biomarkers of pain not only in sickle cell disease, but maybe in hemophilia, because they could not find a relationship between PAR1 and thrombin. So we have to look at these additional proteases. And neutrophil activation and trap formation that releases elastase has been demonstrated to play a role in vasoclusive crisis and acute chest syndrome in sickle cell disease. And uh, we speculate that this may be an actionable target for the treatment of lung injury in addition to ameliorating pain in sickle cell disease. FDA-approved alpha-1 trypsin can be used for clinical trials. So what happens? How does it take us to pain in hemophilia? It's a debilitating consequence of hemophilia A. Um, it's, we all know, we are all experts here, so I don't need to describe this. But I want to say that it affects physical and mental health, impairing the quality of life. But hemophilia-specific pain management remains an underappreciated and unmet need requiring a mechanism-based understanding that we want to develop. 
And here is what we feel, why there is pain, and why it also may explain some of it that why the effects, direct effects on osteoblasts and bones could not explain why the bone resorption was occurring. So what happens is much more complex if you look at here. There is bleeding in the joints. There is hemorrhage. What will happen with hemorrhage? We will have these red blood cells releasing cell-free heme. This will cause oxidative stress and it will affect the chondrocytes. And in addition, all these inflammatory cells will waken up, get activated, start releasing their contents, including proteases and inflammatory cytokines. And we heard in the last two talks that there is inflammation. And at the same time, they would ask, start the osteoclastic activity or increase it and, and bone resorption would occur. So we thought that, and, and then when that occurs, what happens is they will activate the nerve fibers pretty much in the same way as I showed in the schema or cartoon for sickle cell disease. So we thought that these factor eight knockout mice described by Dr. Taylor uh, would be an excellent model to understand the pain behaviors because we don't know how to even quantify pain in hemophilia. This will be different than sickle cell disease. So we use multiple tests. One is to see if they are sensitive to touch. If something is hurting, people do get sensitive to touch. And for this, we use one fry filaments. We apply them on the, on the, uh, on the plantar surface of the hind paw. And, and when we apply them, the mouse would lift the paw. And if it hurts more, they will lift it quickly and more. And so the paw withdrawal frequency is counted. And higher the paw withdrawal frequency, more is the indication of pain or hyperalgesia. Then we looked at weight bearing. Because if, if the people, as, as Dr. Sigla described, you know, their activity level is low in all the charts that she showed. Why is it low? Because, you know, they don't want to use their legs and they, they, they hurt. And so we developed a test, which is weight bearing incapac incapacitance to see the weight exerted by both limbs should be equal. If they're hurting, it will not be equal. And the higher the difference, more will be the indication of pain or bone disease. I mean, don't quote me on that. Uh, and then we looked at the non-evoked behaviors, which would actually reflect upon the daily activities that are affected in humans. It's called, so what we do is we leave the mice unrestrained in their natural habitat. And there are specialized cameras which record them. And then over a two minute period using software programs, we try to isolate these features, which are called rearing, where they, mice often like to, if they are in a cage, they like to stand on their two feet and look outside. They're curious animals. And they keep moving around. They don't sit and they groom each, they groom themselves all the time. You know, they take care of themselves. Um, so what happens is, if they are hurting, they will not move. They'll just sit in one place. So there'll be less grooming, there will be less locomotion, and there will be less rearing. So we looked at and we quantified these. And what we found was, in the dark solid circles, you see the mice uh, with hemophilia A or factor eight knockout. And in the open circles are the control mice which are the same genetic background. And we did a time-bound study from six weeks until 12 weeks. And what we found that after eight or nine weeks of age, they start developing hypersensitivity to mechanical, hyper, uh, mechanical stimuli with one fry filaments. And this keeps increasing with the age up to 12 weeks. We have now done up to 20 weeks. And then they demonstrate very high static instability or weight bearing. And I think some of these tests can be applied instead of looking at the MRIs or scans. Um, these are simpler and people can also do them at home. And then we looked at locomotion and we see that the locomotion is decreased, the rearing is decreased, and their uh, grooming is decreased, which means that their daily life activities or physical activity is very much decreased and is impaired in these mice, much like the patients with sickle cell disease, uh, with, with hemophilia, sorry. 
uh, been working on sickle cell disease for too long. So from this, we conclude that factor eight knockout mice show features of chronic mechanical hypersensitivity, similar to what we could we can start actually appreciating more in hemophilia A. And locomotion and daily activities are impaired in these mice. And it is likely that some of the tests used here, like weight distribution and statics instability, there are there is equipment called balance master dual uh, force plate, which can be used for people and it can be utilized to, to do quantitative sensory testing or bone strength. And then grip strength by dynam dynamometer can also be utilized. These are fairly simple tests. And therefore we think that factor eight knockout mice can serve as appropriate models to examine the mechanisms underlying hemophilia pain to develop target, targeted therapies. So in a nutshell, I have shown you that serpents play a big role and this cartoon actually tells us exactly what happens. So under normal conditions, proteases like thrombin, like chymotrypsin, like um, tryptase, elastase, and serpents, their inhibitors would be in a good balance. They will be in equal amount but when there is a condition, as I showed, because we have proven in sickle cell disease, the serpent's inhibitors go down and the proteases go up. So what do we do when there is the endogenous mechanism is actually impaired to counterbalance these proteases, which are going up? So if we give them alpha-1 antitrypsin, as I showed you with the data, we can actually counterbalance these increased proteases and reduce pain. And with that, I would like to thank the vast team of my laboratory scientists and my many collaborators and the funding agencies, including Griffles, for providing us Prolastin C. And thank you very much. So we'll take the questions after all the talks, and I would invite Dr. Sid, uh, Dr. Nikki, as she would like to be called, to give us the talk. Just for a few minutes. All right, I'm gonna start my, yeah. I'm gonna start my timer because I honestly could talk about pain and physical therapy forever. Um, and I really only have 40 minutes. Um, while I'm doing that and setting up my computer, if you guys want to get up, stretch, move around, that's the PT in me. Um, it really does, you know, kind of energize you and, and you know, get, um, get you through your, your last speaker of uh, this session. All right. Um, my name is Nikki Clark. I'm a doctor of physical therapy at the University of Colorado. Um, most of you probably don't know me. I'm newer to the hemophilia um, population, but um, I've been studying and practicing pain management as a physical therapist um, for years, I'm working with sickle cell um, patients, uh, vascular anomalies of patients, and then just general um, chronic pain. Um, and so today we're going to take everything um, from the previous presenters and say, how do we treat this in the clinic? Um, a lot of times chronic pain is really um, daunting to try to take on when you say, I'm just a physical therapist or I'm just a hematologist, because as the, as the um, presentations before have demonstrated, you kind of feel like you have to be a chemist and a neurologist and an endocrinologist and um, kind of doing everything um, uh, yourself to kind of manage this. And so we're going to talk about ways that um, in our hematology clinics and our HTCs, we can um, kind of go through um, the best way to screen, assess, um, measure, and then treat uh, chronic pain and kind of joint health issues. I don't, I don't have any disclosures. 
Um, here's our overview um, today. I'm going to kind of summarize uh, the previous presenters, and then I'm going to go into what you guys can do in the clinic um, and um, how to kind of collaborate between uh, primary care physicians, your physical therapists, social workers, um, nursing within your uh, facilities. And so why do physical therapists care about pain, um, especially with people with bleeding disorders? Um, and pain, impa pain impacts everything. Um, so it's not just this number between one and or zero and 10. That's not really going to tell us what that pain stopping them from doing. We know, we all know somebody with hemophilia that, you know, they are at an eight out of 10, but they go to work every single day. Um, you know, they're, they're still fishing, they're still going on, um, you know, travel and things like that. And so that zero to 10 doesn't really give us any indication of what to do. You know, if someone says a five, what do you, what do, you do with that five besides document it for insurance companies? Um, and so it's really asking, what does your pain stop you from doing? And so you have somebody come into the clinic and they say, I'm a five out of 10. And then you kind of have to go past that and you say, okay, so um, are you doing everything you'd like to be doing with this five out of 10? Are you still enjoying your hobbies? Are you still able to um, participate in social activities with friends or family? Um, are you still able to work? Are you on disability? Things like that. Um, trying to figure out what the pain is limiting is then what we use as our goals in physical therapy. So, you know, my goal isn't to get someone from an eight to a four out of 10. My goal is for someone to miss only two days of work out of the month instead of five or six. Um, and the same goes with in the pediatric populations, um, them being able to stay in school and participate in the full curriculum, participate in gym class, things like that. What is their pain stopping them from doing? Um, in the general population, we think about joint issues, um, osteoarthritis, um, women, especially at age 50, have a like kind of a double, um, an increase in uh, rates of osteoarthritis compared to men. That kind of levels off at around 80 years old. Um, but this is just something that whether you have a bleeding disorder or not, you have this risk. Um, nobody is immune to trauma. Nobody's in, immune to a slip and a fall. Nobody's immune to a car accident, things like that. So in the general population, you're going to see these. So we can't just kind of ignore that in our population. Um, surgery, again, that's just something that, you know, inevitably at some point you're going to have some sort of surgery, whether it's wisdom tooth extraction, whether it's a joint replacement, um, whether it's a GI surgery or something like that. And then your occupation, you know, you have people, you'll, um, you can talk to people who, um, are professional athletes. You can talk to people who, um, were in the military, things like that. And they say, oh, you know, I have this wear and tear from doing X, Y, Z. And so you can't, um, kind of dissociate the occupation from the person. And so our bone and joint issues in hemophilia and people with bleeding disorder, we're talking primary issues that's directly linked with hemophilia. You're born with hemophilia. These things are likely to happen. Your hemarthrosis, so your joint bleeds. They can be traumatic. Um, again, a slip and a fall, um, you know, sports, kind of um, and any kind of accident that kind of happens to that. Surgical, so again, uh, you might have to, um, ha you have a rotator cuff tear from something, the bleed is managed, but then that needs to get fixed. So um, the trauma of the surgery, again, can lead to hemarthrosis and then spontaneous. We all know with our severe patients, they just wake up one morning and all of a sudden their knee is, you know, um, swollen, hot, and they did nothing. Um, and so all of those um, examples of ways that we have hemarthrosis, these are primary um, joint issues that we're going to see in hemophilia. Um, hemophilic arthropathy is what happens after multiple hemarthrosis. So, um, you know, we want to be mindful of the acute hemarthrosis and then what happens after, um, especially in our older population now who um, didn't have the best treatment that we have available for our kids now. Um, the um, And we do the hemophilic arthropathy, the joint um, assessment score, the HDHS. And then as the previous presenter talked about, um, low bone mineral density. And so we found that whether, whether you have overt bleeding or you're a carrier with bleeding um, symptoms that might not be as severe, or you don't have any bleeding symptoms, we found that um, 
our uh, carriers are also having the same low bone mineral density. Um, secondary, so this is kind of the sequelae. Um, osteoporosis, so we're, um, we were talking about that before. Um, I put Wolf's Law in there because that's what I think about as a physical therapist. It's the opposite of if you don't use it, you lose it. If you use it, you get more of it. And so when we have people who are afraid to move, we have um, our older population that might have significant hemophilic arthropathy, multiple target joints. Those people aren't going to be getting up and around. They're not going to be having that impact um, through their bones and through their skeletal system to kind of have that osteoblast, that bone building um, kind of re reaction happening. Um, osteoarthritis, like we said, you know, that's our kind of wear and tear arthritis. We're not immune to um, that just because you have a bleeding disorder, you're not immune to having kind of the regular um, joint issues that we see in the general population. Um, disuse atrophy. So we have somebody with a chronic um, target joint, they're having multiple bleeds in a year, and then all of a sudden they haven't walked on that leg in 12 months. Um, the disuse, the lack of um, activation of the muscles, the weakness, um, you also get overuse on the other side. Um, those are kind of things, joint issues, bone health issues that can come from having a hemarthrosis. Um, and then contractures, that's where we have, again, that target joint or we don't rehab it all the way. So you're not necessarily going to have a contracture if you have a hemarthrosis, but um, you know, without skilled intervention and things like that, that's something that can then affect if you can't get full range of motion, um, you know, you can have more wear and tear, um, on that joint or other joints that have to compensate. And then obesity, um, in obesity in terms of, uh, gait pattern and, um, the peak pressures that are going through us. So if we have somebody, um, who has a, a higher BMI, we know that they walk a little bit differently. They have more hip external rotation. They have a little bit more knee flexion, um, and their legs are in that abducted position. And so that's going to put the force from their foot to their knee at a different location in the knee joint than somebody who's going to have a more um, upright, um, what we call neutral posture. And so um, again, when we have um, any one of these secondary issues, we always want to make sure that we're screening for um, um, screening for things on our annual comp comprehensive visits, as well as our typical questions we ask, how many bleeds have you had, um, and, and things like that. And so we have um, plenty of assessment tools for bone and joint issues for primary joint damage, um, especially things like uh, hemarthrosis and hemophilic arthropathy. We have our imaging. Um, so someone might have a fall injury. We get the x-ray, um, the elbow x-rayed. And then, um, you know, if that happens a couple of times or that joint keeps bleeding, then we might do an MRI to see if there's, a, you know, any um, uh, arthritis kind of forming in there. Ultrasound here, um, this is a big thing that HTC physical therapists are working on is this point of care ultrasound or the musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, we have one in our clinic. So somebody comes in with a joint bleed and we kind of want to know, is it blood in there? Is it, um, is it different types of, uh, swelling? You know, how, what is the joint surface look like in relation to the swelling? We just get the ultrasound machine out. We can save some photos. Um, and then we can use that when they come back in three or four days after some factor um, and see, you know, is that lessening? Is that, are, is the treatment that we're giving them effective? Um, what I do every day is the hemophilia joint health score, the HJHS. And so this is something that kind of is um, kind of our storyteller. It doesn't, it doesn't tell me what's going to happen. It's telling me what already happened. So we do have those patients that fall um, fall away from their annual follow-up. They might not be there for four or five years and they show up and you say, how many bleeds have you had in the last five years? And they say, I have no idea. So this is a good, good tool to go back to when they were last seen. And then when they were seen, um, at that point in time, and then compare what does their joint health look like? Um, again, it's not a good predictor of, um, what to do about it, but it's a good predictor of how we're treating it and how they're managing these, um, joint bleeds and things like that. Um, we have a surgical history, so you can always, you know, especially with late diagnoses, people who didn't know that they needed um, perioperative factor and infusions and things like that, we say, oh, when they were, you know, 14, they had an ACL reconstruction, that's when they were diagnosed with a bleeding disorder because, you know, the, the surgery didn't go quite as planned. Um, and so just trying to figure out what's going on. 
if we've had an ACL repair, we already know that the surgical trauma, you know, that can also lead to earlier onset of osteoarthritis. And then the trauma also has bleeding component. Was there joint bleeding when we were doing that surgery? And then observation of movement, um, gait, functional ability. That's what I'm going to go into a lot today. Um, and then uh, the, we at University of Colorado, we are getting built um, – we are building a gait and motion analysis lab. And so we have force um, plates that are going into the floor. We have a planter pressure mat so people can stand on it and it'll show you how much pressure is through each part of the foot. And then we have, we'll have a, um, a force, force plate treadmill. And so we can analyze gait and how much time, how much weight they're putting on one side and then seeing, you know, after a bleed, how long does it take to normalize that gait again? Does it normalize? Um, does it make a difference if they're wearing shoes, if they're not wearing shoes? Does it make a difference um, the length of time that bleed took? Was it, you know, just a high dose and a low dose and it was gone? Or did we treat it for two weeks? Um, just kind of getting a lot of information from observation. And then our secondary tools, these are what um, my colleagues were talking about before. Our DEXA scan, our vitamin D levels. Um, are, you know, histor historically problematic joints. As a physical therapist, I don't want to do any sort of intervention on an elbow that doesn't really move very well, because I know that elbow bone um, health is subpar. It's not, I don't want to cause a fracture, which causes a bleed and all these things. So if we have somebody, um, haven't seen them in a while, and that, and a certain joint is giving them a problem, this is where, um, I would, I would really, really urge people to get imaging on that so that we just have a good idea of what we're looking at. Um, again, you don't want to be um, doing an intervention on somebody when you don't really know what the, the impairment is on the inside. And then again, joint range of motion over time, you know, ideally these people follow up with us one time a year. We know that doesn't happen. I just had somebody who hadn't been seen in nine years. <laughs> Um, and so there was a lot of change, a lot of history, um, and, and we were able to kind of set him up with a plan, but it was really hard to know a specific joint, what had happened in those nine years, and is it safe for me to kind of move it around? How much can I stress it versus, um, you know, protecting the integrity of the joint and having somebody like an orthopedic surgeon look at it? And so physical therapy assesses bleeding disorders, again, at our annual comprehensive visit, I'm looking at all um, of these different aspects of, of a patient um, when they come in, especially pain. Um, pain is near and dear to my heart. Uh, that is what I specialize in. Um, a lot of times people ask, why are you asking so many questions about pain? Um, and it's because, again, zero to 10 doesn't give me what I need to help this person. Um, during these comprehensive visits, we find incidentalomas. So they were coming in for a factor refill, new prescription for the year, and then they're talking about plantar fasciitis, or they're talking about, you know, I really um, am losing my balance a lot, um, especially in our older populations. And we say, that, that's not necessarily what I do, but I'll, I'll kind of get you to somebody who can do that. And so we identify these things through our evaluation, and then we can refer out as needed. And this can be, you know, any provider, um, nursing, advanced practice providers, um, our physicians, anybody can kind of say, thank you so much for telling me that. Um, I know a lot of times they use their HTCs and their hematologists as their PCP, but you say you really need to go to your PCP. Um, and so we are lucky at our HTC that we're going to have this gym. So, you know, if somebody has low back pain and they just need a couple of, uh, home exercise programs and things like that, that's something that we can take care of. If you don't have a physical therapist on staff, um, get to know one in your community that, you, that knows hemophilia, knows the precautions to take, isn't going to just start dry needling somebody without asking. Um, those are the kind of things that you really want to have that community so that if you can't handle it. Um, you don't have the resources or the time to investigate further, you do something with it. You're still um, helping the patient kind of with that um, finding. Our follow-up visits, um, again, we reassess everything, you know, was resting, was that a good idea? You know, did that make any difference? Um, the home exercise pro 
uh, home exercise program review and progression. So we'll have people come back in and say, you know, did that work? Did that not work? Let's try something else. And then our acute visits, that's when somebody, you know, this summer is a great example. Hi, my um, son's at camp and he fell off the bunk bed being Mary Poppins, you know, and now he's got an ankle bleed and a knee like contusion and things like that. And so we get that and we look at all of these factors. Um, and at the acute visit specifically, I like to do pain education. At an acute visit, I'm not going to go in there and start cranking on the leg and, oh, you know, show me how you're walking. Yeah, that looks like it really hurts. Keep going. You know, that's not that's not what I'm there for. But we know that pain is not just limited to that foot. You know, if you have somebody every year, they've gone to a bleeding disorders camp and then they go and they get a bleed, they're going to be fearful of going to camp. They're going to be fearful of doing that activity again. And so explaining to them the pain that you're experiencing during this acute episode is normal. We want you to have pain because that makes you understand when to stop, when to treat it. If you have a bleed and it doesn't hurt, that can be a dangerous situation. So not, to, you know, we don't want them to be afraid of the pain. A lot of times we don't want them to say, oh, it doesn't hurt because they don't want to get a needle, a needle stick. They don't want to get an infusion. They don't want to stop what they're doing. Um, you know, that pain education right up front say, thank you so much for telling me about your pain. This is actually really normal for what you're doing. Um, and we, we anticipate that pain to go away as we give you this treatment. Um, and so you just kind of normalize the process of having that pain. The pain's super important. It tells us what we need to do. It tells us if our factor's working, you know, if are we giving factor, nothing's happening. Do we have an inhibitor? Things like that. It's really, really an important tool to kind of help us with our intervention. And so during those acute visits, especially day of accident or the second day after an injury, again, I'm, I'm measuring what I can, but I'm not doing any intervention that's going to prolong um, the bleeding, but I am giving them pain education on how to think about physical activity and what to think about resting now um, so that they can get back to something like that. This is one of my um, favorite slides here. <laughs> Um, this is, this is a lot of times what patients think that we're doing. Which one is you look at this thing. Look at these faces. Is your face crying? That means you're a 10, you know? So, so we have our pumpkins here. Um, which one best describes your pain? That's, that's where a lot of times our clinics and our providers stop. We stop right there. What does it feel like? Which one best describe you? Okay. Next. Um, this is what, what, I try to use as my next step. And then that kind of leads me a five out of 10. Where are you a five out of 10? When are you a five out of 10? And things like that. Um, so again, we have our visual analog scale. A lot of times insurance require it or uh, documentation systems require that you put a number in before you sign your note. So it's not um, for nothing to get that score, but it's not going to guide you in your intervention. Um, standardized questionnaires. These are ones that I really like to use at a, as um, a physical therapist. We have our um, upper extremity functional index, our lower extremity functional scale. We have ankle and foot measures. We have knee osteoarthritis measures. So specifically, they say my knee hurts. That says when your knee hurts, what does it stop you from doing? Not your knees out of five. So those are the things that I like to do at this time. It stops you from doing your yard work. It's hard for you to get in and out of the bathtub, on and off of the toilet, in and out of your car, do some intervention and then retest that. Um, again, it's very specific to that body part and it's subjective and pain is very subjective. And so it gives them an outlet on which to express what they're feeling and how it's limiting them um, that we don't necessarily need to um, intervene with. We can just say, please tell me how you feel. It's not our job to say, is that right or not right? Um, and then our functional standardized tests, these are um, very objective. They have norms. Um, our six minute walk test, our timed up and go, and our five times sit to stand. Those are all validated um, for um, the sequelae of uh, bleeding disorders. And so hemophilia is very rare. Um, we're not going to have a lot of objective standardized tests that are then validated in hemophilia, but they're validated for balance issues. They're validated for um, deconditioning, um, the timed up and go and the six minute walk test. Um, that's walking, balance, safety, all those kind of things that we do want to measure um, in, in our population because we know if someone falls, someone has a bleed, that's what we want to stop. 
And then the Promise um, is a database of a lot of questionnaires. The ones that we use are the pain intensity, pain inference, and pain behavior um, questionnaires. They fit really nice into a red cap um, survey. And, and so it's really nice if you're going to track something over time um, to use the Promise. And so our assessment of pain, so the dip, typical joint pain presentations. Um, this is kind of where I wish I had like a walkway and I could just kind of like move around. Um, but your antalgic gait, they're not putting weight on that. This is a lot of times what you'll see in an acute phase. They might be tiptoeing, you know, if it's an ankle or a knee, um, just kind of trying to get to the next foot. Um, decreased weight shift onto a painful limb. This is something that kind of develops over time. So you'll have your, um, I'll just grab this, maybe. Okay. And so you'll have your um, patient and they'll kind of be shifting their weight off of whether it's a painful hip, painful ankle, and they might be doing something like that. That would be acute, but over time that just turns into a quick step on the, on the painful limb, the, the antalgic limb, and then a longer stance time to kind of recover from that. Um, decreased arm swing. Again, if you're not taking a full step, you're not going to get that full arm swing. So if this arm or this foot is kind of uh, not wanting to accept the weight, you're not gonna get that arm swing. This is what you can watch for from the waiting room to your office. You don't need to be a gait expert. This is just something that you say, that kind of looks weird. I should ask them about it. I ask them, what, what's kind of going on? Is something bothering you and you know, kind of stopping you from walking the way you want to? We also have, um, in the HDHS, we talk about atrophy. So you come in, they're not putting a lot of weight on it, and then you notice the calf is very flat. Um, you know, the calf circumference is, is narrow. We're saying they're not using that, um, especially if the other side is kind of hypertroph hypertrophied. Um, decreased strength and range of motion, use of, a, of an assistive device. We are actually not seeing that as much in our younger population as, as we were before, which is a really... Um, a really nice thing to see as a physical therapist, kind of the population aging without as much disability. Um, and then acute pain of the contralateral side. So this is your compensation. So you have somebody who's been off a leg for two weeks, three weeks, it keeps re-bleeding. Now their other leg is sore, it hurts. Um, you might have some, you know, maybe an ankle bleed, a subclinical bleed, just some achiness there. And then you have the kinesophobia and the apprehension. So this is where they don't want you to touch it. They don't want you to move it. They might not want to move it. And then um, the apprehension is kind of fear of returning to that activity. So you say, hey, I just want you to rest your foot on the floor and it's not happening. So they're just really apprehensive of, of kind of getting back into the motion there. And then postural asymmetries um, in our patients, usually in standing is the best way to um, measure this because in sitting, we're kind of negating the knees and the ankles and their effect on posture. Um, and then your elbows, when we're looking at elbows, when you're sitting, that's not really gonna affect your posture too much. And so always kind of assess that postural asymmetry in standing. Um, so physical inter interventions for joint um, pain. And so we wanna improve range of motion. We know if we don't improve that range of motion and they get a contracture, we're gonna be having unequal forces between the right side and the left side and between the knee and the ankle and the hip of that, that one side of the, the body. Um, strengthening, we know we want to have a lot of muscle strength and control and stability around these joints of the ankle, especially the ankle and the knee and the hip. Um, you know, if you just think about a, a skeleton in science class, you know, if it wasn't on the rack, it'd fall. So our muscles are what holds everything up. And so if we don't have a lot of, um, muscle tone, muscle bulk, muscle control, um, and instead we have atrophy, disuse, deconditioning, those joints aren't going to have as much stability leading you to be at higher risk for injury. Um, ergonomic assessments. We're going to talk a little bit more in, in the prevention um, part of this, but, you know, if we have somebody who does a really repetitive job, they stock shelves, things like that, really um, try to give them options on ways that they can modify that. And so, you know, a lot of times you'll have a hand or an arm preference, and then they'll always be going one way. And then that foot, that knee, that hip, even low back starts to bother them. And so, hey, just remember, maybe put your card on the other side. Um, 
Uh, I don't know why, but people with bleeding disorders love very high risk jobs. I don't know what it is, but everybody, you know, construction worker works in a warehouse, uh, fixes up cars. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's, uh, it's awesome. And at the same time, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm always worried about what's going to happen. Um, and then this is, again, I, I offer pain education to anybody. It doesn't need to be an acute bleed. But again, why are you feeling pain? Why is your arthritis causing you pain? Why does it change with the weather? Why does it change um, with stress? Why does it change when you get COVID? And all of a sudden I have COVID and now my joints are terrible. Um, things like that. Those are all things that we talk about in relation to what are you experiencing? How normal or abnormal is it? And then what can we do to um, moderate that? Aquatic therapy is fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, status post acute bleed. And so again, it's taking the weight off of you. You can um, really do a lot of weight bearing postural re-education without the pressure of your body and gravity on those joints before they're ready. Especially somebody who has had hemophilic arthropathy, very severe in a knee, five, seven years, they're putting off the replacement because their orthopedic surgeon says, I don't want to do that in a 28 year old. So they put it off. That whole side is atrophied. We can't expect them to get a new knee and then in three months be going off like they, like, you know, any other person um, that that's getting a new knee or a new hip or something like that. The aquatic therapy is a wonderful transition between, um, you know, pre-joint replacement and kind of that um really arthritic side, all those compensations, it's a really nice transition to kind of getting back up um, against gravity and, and kind of normalizing. Um, and then neuromuscular re-education, kind of the same thing, just retraining. Once they have a bleed and it's completely healed, we, it's okay. It's safe to put weight back on that side so that we can normalize the right and left side. And then balance, like I said, if they have poor balance, they fall. When people fall and they have a bleeding disorder, things are bad. Um, and so if we can make sure just screen for balance, a single leg stance, some people can't even do it five seconds. And so, you know, you don't have to be testing them for three minutes to say, oh, do they have balance or not? You know, with your eyes open on the clinic floor, can you stand on one leg? And you'll be very surprised to see even young adults with terrible, terrible balance. Those joint bleeds over time have just um, made their proprioception not the same. They're not weight bearing on that leg as much. And then again, poor balance, fall, we, you know, we don't want to have a head injury or an elbow fracture or a hip fracture, um, especially in our older, older populations, bleeding disorder or not, hip fractures um, in our older populations have 50% mortality um, within one year of hip fractures. So, you know, again, nothing to do with bleeding disorders. That's the general population. But if you combine low bone mineral density, maybe uh, an inactive lifestyle due to fear or fear of bleeding and things like that. And then um, a poor balance as we age or, you know, just as a, as a consequence of joint bleeds on the lower half of the body that kind of interrupt that feedback we get from our, um, our nervous system. And so I have a, um, at the University of Colorado, Dr. Buckner and I are working on a pain clinic within our HTC. So after comps, um, if people are kind of identified as having more of a pain problem than a hemophilia problem, um, we'll see them separately just for pain. Um, and so I have two patient cases and kind of outcomes um, that we've been working on. And so the first case, 64-year-old man, seven-year history of chronic daily pain. And this is widespread head to toe, um, not necessarily joint pain. Past medical history, mild hemophilia B, so, and, and he's 64 years old. So he was never on Profi. Profi was never um, something for him. Even pre-activity Profi was just not something that was available to him at that, this time. Um, untreated bleeds as a child. He said that they treated the bleeds that were so bad by just um, aspirating the knee and pulling all that blood out, which we all know now we wouldn't have somebody do any sort of joint puncture without prophylaxis. So, um, it, you know, what they thought was really good at the time um, ended up adding to the trauma from these untreated bleeds. Um, he has hep C that's been treated, a gunshot wound to the knee, um, cervical fusion, severe lumbar stenosis, right shoulder replacement, left shoulder rotator cuff repair. So this guy's got it all. Like, um, you know, you think of somebody when they come with hemophilia, this is everything that they're coming with. 
And again, we're not a neurologist. We're not a neurosurgeon. We're not orthopedic surgery. Um, these are things that we need to recognize, acknowledge as part of their bleeding disorder kind of history, and then kind of put them where they need to go. Um, objectively, um, he has a left uh, elbow flexion contracture, so um, he can't get to extension. He's lacking 14 degrees of, um, of full extension, right knee flexion contracture, limited dorsiflexion, bilaterally, um, hip weakness, posture. Um, his posture kind of ended up being with knees flexed, hip flexed, trunk forward um, to kind of give his um, lumbar stenosis some room, um, let those nerves decompress. Um, and then his center, center of mass was shifted to left of center because the gunshot um, wound was in the right. And so he kind of always kind of stood because that knee just never really healed very well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, his HJHS score overall is a 31. For a 64-year-old, that's, um, that's not all too high. And then uh, the modified Oswestry, which is a low back questionnaire, he had a 59% disability because of his low back. Um, and, you know, chicken or the egg, what led to what? We don't really know, but he does have hemophilia. And we know that if we don't correct some of this, he's going to have to have some intervention down the road. Um, so he had right knee pain, uh, low back pain with radiation. So again, more neurology. Um, you know, that's something that I would want imaging on before I start stretching him, pulling on him, pushing on him, things like that. Um, shoulders and neck, he had a cervical fusion, but that was still giving him a lot of pain. And then impact, this is what I care about right here. Poor sleep, decreased quality of life, decreased social interaction and mood. Having chronic pain for seven years, he's withdrawing from kind of social aspects. He can't stand up for very long, so he doesn't go to parties. Um, he really likes his neighborhood, but he can't walk around the block anymore. Things like that. That's what I care about. I want him to be able to go do those things. So um, we come up with an intervention that kind of addresses the impact of his pain. And then our intervention, hip and lower extremity strengthening. Um, he ended up with an MRI that showed um, severe lumbar um, stenosis with um, nerve root compression from L4 to S1. Um, and so that was telling me, yes, your radiating symptoms, you know, are clearly um, anatomical in nature. And then we did lower extremity flossing. So we're kind of trying to get the, the nerves that come out of the low back down the legs, give them a little bit more room to move. I did some posture and ergonomic corrections with him. He works from home on a laptop. And so I kind of tried to, you know, raise the laptop monitor. So his head with the fusion wasn't putting so much strain there. Um, and then pain neuroscience education. Why is his whole body head to toe in this panic response all the time? Um, he's not being able, he's not able to sleep because of the pain. Um, and then when he doesn't sleep, the pain's worse. So we're kind of having this whole cycle and then I'm just educating him on that makes sense that, you know, it's, it's science that when you have poor sleep, your pain feels worse. When your pain feels worse, you have poor sleep. You know, you're, it's not weird. It's not um, abnormal for what you're explaining. This is normal We for what you have. Well, I want you to get back to where you were. Um, and so again, just letting them know, are, are they in immediate danger? That's what they always think. So he said, oh my gosh, all of our patients have our records immediately the same time that we have them, which is kind of a problem sometimes. And he said, I got this MRI and it's terrible, all this stuff. And so he thought immediately he was in danger, something terrible was going to happen, spinal cord injury. And so kind of just going through it, I said, you know, if the radiologist read this and they thought you were in danger, they wouldn't have let you leave. <laughs> Um, and so what, you know, kind of just explaining, validating their concerns and then letting them know what you're going to do about it. And so the outcome initially, right knee pain improved with um, some of the lower extremity strengthening and the posture, the center of mass shifted centrally. So kind of off that left side um, and kind of moved more center and then slight improvement in low back pain. But the neurologic symptoms progressed, referred to neurosurgery, scheduled for lumbar laminectomy. So again, I, you know, we're not able to fix everything, but we did identify some things. And then because we were working with him, checking on these things, when those symptoms kind of, kind of kept popping up and I said, how long is that happening? How long is that happening? And, uh, and then I sent him in. And so, um, we, we got the lumbar, lumbar laminectomy with a, a fusion done. 
and he, his pain is drastically improved. Our patient case number two, um, this is a female, 53-year-old um, right ankle pain since 2016. We have past medical history, factor seven deficiency, HIV, hep C treated, cardiac disease, um, and a right ankle target joint. Uh, I met, mentioned the cardiac disease because um, the factor seven products have that interaction with the heart. And so you kind of have to almost suboptimally optimally treat them with factor to preserve heart function, um, you know, because with a factor seven um, kind of overdose on somebody with a cardiac issue, we can have, um, you know, kind of some some side effects that we, we don't really want to have a complication with. Um, and so objective, she has a right ankle contracture, um, hip weakness, posture. Um, because she has that right ankle contracture into plantar flexion, when her foot goes flat, she has to get hip um, knee hyperextension to stand up straight. And so um, that's kind of the result of this right ankle contracture is in other things that come down the line. Right hip external rotation and abducted. So she kind of just has it out to the side, primarily um, relying on the left leg. And so her center of mass is shifted to the left. She wears a ground reaction AFO and her HHS is a 39. 16 points of that is the right ankle. Um, and so this is someone where we really have one joint that's kind of our pain generator. And um, we can see that in our HHS score. We have um, right ankle pain, but then she has generalized deconditioning because it hurts. She doesn't walk very much so that when she has to walk, you know, spend an hour in the grocery store, she has other issues that come up. It's so sore. It gets super swollen. Um, and then her other joints aren't really used to that. The impact impaired IADLs. So that's like going to the grocery store, um, unable to stand or walk for short periods of time, unable to work full time um, because she, uh, because of her job that requires a lot of standing, she can't work it 40 hours a week. She has to work a reduced schedule. Um, decreased social interaction because by the time she's standing all day at work, she doesn't have the energy. The pain is too high to then go out and, and do things with peers. And then again, mood when, when you can't really do the things that you enjoy doing, you don't really have, um, you have some mood impacts with that. Intervention. Um, quad strengthening, manual joint um, mobilization. There's there's a link to that um, to just show you. We don't have to open that today. Um, that's for the people in the back. Um, postural re-education, aerobic activity, pain neuroscience education, and cryotherapy. So our manual joint mobilizations, she's at a contraction. She has very little arc of motion, but what we did is a manual distraction at that talocrural joint. And so just giving that joint space, it's not gonna be moving, gliding bone on bone but just giving it some space for it to kind of um, uh, kind of have a little bit of that joint. Um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on it right now. But, um, you know, give, give that some mobility, give some of those structures a little bit of a, a break. And then our postural re-education, you know, she's in a ground reaction AFO, but she doesn't trust it. And so that's why she kind of lets it hang out to the side. I said, you know, that carbon fiber is not going anywhere. You know, it's safe to put weight on that. Um, it's not going to collapse on you. And then um, our pain neuroscience education, you know, her big question was why? Why does it hurt all the time no matter what I'm doing? Um, and so we just talked a little bit about how one thing leads to another, how we, you know, it hurts to put weight on it. So then we do other things and then our back starts to hurt. And, um, when we're frustrated because we can't do a full day at work, we have, um, uh, she, she gets disappointed in herself and then having that disappointment, some of that, um, transient depression, um, depressed state, things like that. Um, that all feeds back into it, itself be, and then, you know, a stress response from the pain can increase our pain. And so I just, um, so I just tried to explain to her all of those factors. We even wrote out a list of everything that's going on with her um, and everything that's kind of impacting either an inflammatory response, a stress response, um, a mechanical response in terms of weight bearing on that joint for a long period of time, um, things like that, and just help her understand what's happening. Um, and then again, I don't just tell her, I say, this is what I'm going to do about it, or this is what I'm going to refer you out to. 
And then the outcome um, with the manual joint um, distractions and mobilization, she actually improved dorsiflexion to eight degrees. So now, now that knee on that same side, that right knee doesn't have to be hyperextended anymore, preserving the, the knee joint from that kind of odd force that is placed in weight bearing with it in extension, it can kind of go back into a neutral position. Um, improve posture, improve mood, um, improve confidence in the community. Um, because she walks more normally, she's not embarrassed to go to the grocery store. She's not um, nervous about what people are going to think when, you know, she has a limp and things like that. Um, and then um, decreased infusion frequency for pain. So because the joint is always kind of inflamed and she's on Profi, she was also then infusing for pain in case it was a bleed. And so because she understood her pain a little bit more, she understood kind of the pain generators, she didn't have to infuse quite so frequently, which then also helps with her cardiac condition, making sure we're not um, giving, her, giving her more um, of that factor seven replacement than, than she needs. And so this is another one that um, I really like for the hemophilia population. And so we don't have a cure for hemophilia yet. It's on the horizon. But again, when we think about things like gene therapy and um, emicizumab and things like that, you know, there's indications, only some people qualify, only some people can afford it. And so it's not, it, you know, we're not as close to a cure for everybody. Um, so again, you know, I want a cure for my chronic illness. What color do you want the unicorn? Um, that, that seems like almost something easier to solve. Um, and so again, being in this world of chronic pain and chronic illness, it can almost sometimes feel like it's, it's too much, it's too much to handle. Um, and so this is just kind of a reminder um, about what our patients feel, you know, every day. So if we can't, um, so we've talked about managing them, what we wanna do is prevent joint issues and pain. So early education, gait mechanics, gait mechanics, um, we have a lot of kids, especially kids that were born in the last couple of years that weren't able to go to preschool or daycare because of the pandemic. They didn't really leave the house very often. Um, they didn't really have the exposure to activities um, that, that we would hope for in these developing ages. And so gait mechanics, if we're talking about a foot and we say, oh my gosh, my kid's foot looks like it's a completely flat foot, we expect that. We expect kind of that bubbly looking foot um, you know, the, the medial longitudinal arch, you know, that arch that we're looking for in the foot isn't even near developed by four or five. We don't want to be putting them in orthotics saying, oh my gosh, my, my four-year-old has a flat foot, put them in orthotics, put them in shoes. We actually want to do the opposite. Let them run around, no shoes, encourage play, things like gymnastics where they don't wear shoes so that their foot can really develop. They develop those ankle muscles so that we can kind of protect the ankle from bleeds and things like that. Um, occupational counseling. Um, and then I have a, a link to the most active jobs in America. And so can I have you pull that up? And so um, things for people to consider when they're trying to pick a career for life. Um, no. And so you have to just yeah, open up the browser. It's in the Internet Explorer at the bottom or whatever that is. Um, you see the blue one? Maybe Microsoft Edge? I don't know what it's called. Yeah. And so then can you go to um, the first one for me? The first tab for me? There we go. And so this is this is a sponsored website. It's also from 2019, but it has a really uh, a good um, bit of information on what to consider with a job setting and activity level. How much standing will there be? How much bending, lifting, um, physical activity? How much of it um, is there? And are you on the right prophylaxis? Are you treating your bleeding disorder well enough to be able to handle that? Um, in there, again, this is 2019 before emesismab was kind of widely available to the public um, and things like Idelvion had only been out for a couple of years. Um, you know, it says things like maybe being a nurse tech or, you know, being a physical therapist isn't for you. I don't think we have to make that decision for people anymore, but it's, you know, it is something how much risk are you willing to take um, in your career 
versus the benefit of uh, quality of life and, and kind of self-fulfillment. And so if you want to be, especially up where um, I live in Colorado, we have a lot of extreme sports people, bouldering, alpinists, ice climbing, things that I didn't know were jobs or activities. Um, but we say, you know, if you want to do that, that's okay. But maybe your Emmy's not going to cut it. We really need to work on that. Um, and so consider your job setting, considering, consider a job that's going to give you benefits to access to insurance and things like that, that's going to cover your infusions. And so if you have a really high risk job, but you have to pay or get your own insurance plan, is that going to be something that's sufficient for your health, uh, your bone and joint health over time? Um, and then you can go to the next tab, please. And so this is the 27 most backbreaking jobs in America. I swear we have a patient with every single one of these jobs. Um, I don't know, again, I don't know why they pick these jobs that are so demanding. Um, you know, we obviously have a lot of very smart people um, in our bleeding disorders community. And, and we have these jobs that are so high risk that I have to look up what the job entails um, just so that I can do job specific rehabilitation after a joint bleed or a crush injury. Oh, so the you know, the car fell off the jack and now, you know, you've got a broken wrist and a broken hand and things like that. Um, you can go back to the slideshow. I'll, I'll bring us back to the, maybe. A welder? I probably. Um, there we go. Um, and so um, exposure to very active, varied activities, I'm sure as clinicians, you've all seen this play it safe. They have an online version of it now where you can say, you know, mom, the parent says, what can they do? You can lead them to this website and they can select, you know, from a one, a two and a three score activity and say, I only wanna see things that are a one score. Um, and you can kind of adjust that. Um, and then, um, that's the education we want to give them early on is we don't want to set somebody up maybe in flag football or something like that because they want to play football. And then when everybody at 12 years old starts to play regular football, then they're kind of feeling left out. They've they've lost their social network and things like that. Um, so really just kind of educating them. We want them to be very active. We don't necessarily want them to be in a dangerous situation or in a situation where they're going to have to the HTC or the provider is going to have to tell them, I'm sorry, we can't sign off on that, on that medical release form because we really don't recommend it. Um, so just early education of what causes bleeds, what they can do, what they can do. Um, and then kind of with a side note of things that I would avoid, um, you know, we don't want to start off with, well, you can't do this and you can't do this because then they, they self-limit. If you say, these are all the things you can check the tracker and, uh, these are all the things that you can do. It, it, it really, um, it really leads them to be more optimistic and, and see all the opportunities they have versus all the limitations that they might have later. Um, and then bleed prevention and management, importance of bleed prevention through prophylaxis. Our um, HTC is very conservative. If, you know, it's kind of like a LaCroix, if it kind of smells like fruit, you know, if it smells like a bleed, we'll treat it because the, the risk of not treating it down the line is, is that much uh, greater. Um, and, you know, we don't want these kids with, even if it's a day, we don't want them to be, um, you know, missing that on demand or that profi and things like that, just because we don't want to put them at risk for, for lifelong disability. Um, empowering pediatric populations to self-report and self-treat. This is the importance of camp. With Emmy, a lot of our kids say, I don't even self-infuse. I don't know how to do it. I haven't infused in, you know, on demand in two years. Um, but then we have this whole population now that doesn't really know what to do when it hurts. What does a bleed feel like when you're at, you know, a 20% versus when you were at 0%? Um, so really um, empowering these pediatric populations to kind of understand uh, what it feels like, how to treat it, not be afraid to treat it, and not, not be afraid to tell mom or dad because they're going to have to get a poke or they're going to have to get something. Really saying, this is kind of how we do it, and, and I want you to be as active as possible, and this is your path to being active and, and healthy over time. We have price. Um, which is rice with our extra P for protection. So protection, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, at our facility, we'll give them cryo cuffs if it's a if it's kind of a major bleed post-operative, um, so that that ice can be on there all the time. Um, kind of the protect rest. That's hard for for a young kid. You know, sometimes it's even harder for our older adults.
monitor for vitamin D levels. As we heard, you can just do that in your annual comprehensive visits. Um, promote daily physical activity, again, with some of those cleaning screening questionnaires, which also help with pain. If you say, what do you do for activity? And they say, well, I used to golf, but my ankle bothers me so much I can't swing anymore. That's two kind of um, things to make you think, okay, well, their quality of life might be impacted if they can't do a hobby that they're really um, fond of, and they're not getting the activity that they used to be getting. Um, and then assess joints, joints in women and individuals um, capable of menstruation. Wickham um, at our at our uh, HTC is what we kind of refer that to um, with bleeding disorders. So we don't we know that they don't have to have zero um, factor eight levels or factor nine levels for us to um, know that they're going to have some risk for bone mineral density issues. And so we can't forget about our women um, and individuals capable of menstruation in terms of following them annually. These are things we don't really want to miss out, even if they're having um, they're not having overt bleeds. We still want to check on them every single year, make sure things like pelvic pain due to heavy menstrual periods, things like that. You know, um, it's not a joint, but it's a, it's a pain that is going to be very prevalent in this population with bleeding disorders. We can't kind of forget about them um, and really include them into that annual comprehensive visit. Anything that you would check um, with a male with um, bleeding disorder, you know, kind of run through those same questions. And then next step for research. So again, at our at our um, facility, we're doing a gate study. It's called the POBOY study, led by Dr. Beth Warren. And um, we're looking at ground reaction forces and gait patterns in people with hemophilia versus healthy controls, doing things like running, jumping, cutting at 45 degree angles with shoes on and with shoes off and kind of looking at the differences there. And then um, the gait mechanics for people with and without footwear, you know, that's what we're trying to figure out with that study. Pre and post operative PT protocols. Can a PT protocol postpone the timeline of a joint replacement in a person with bleeding disorders? So if we catch them and they say, oh, it's, it's a two out of 10 or it's an eight out of 10, but I still golf, I just don't do, you know, I wouldn't do a Friday and a Saturday. That's a kind of a, um, an indicator, hey, can we intervene now? work on those um, structures and then say, you know, if we can protect it, get that strengthening, get that balance back, does that kind of um, prolong the need for our joint replacements? Because again, our orthopedic surgeons don't like when we have to send a 30 year old for an ankle replacement and things like that, because they just know what's gonna happen in 20 years and in um, 20 years after that. Um, and then comparing long-term effects of joint health among different treatment approaches. Um, Dr. Chiller was here, or was going to be here, and um, she has a great study um, going on right now, and they're looking at um, the effects of athletes who are an ME for prophylaxis versus um, a factor eight replacement for prophylaxis. And then the, they're kind of just studying um, what's, what's the difference in joint bleeds and joint health over time between those two in treatment interventions in athletes. Um, and then we have our extended half-life products, our um, short-acting half-life products, and our non-factor products. Those are all different types of treatment approaches. And you know, right now, so many new things are coming out it's going to be a while, like Dr. Thomas was saying, um, it's going to be a while before we can kind of put together the data and say, hey, what is the best thing overall for joint health, functional mobility, pain, quality of life um, down the line? All right. It's all you. Oh, thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, Nikki. So we had some wonderful presentations. Uh, we already had questions and answers for Dr. Taylor, but now you can shower us with your questions. I'm sure you've prepared a lot of them. When we're talking about footwear to protect the feet, if they, um, I would say in, in situations where we have a neurologic condition um, or a sensory kind of overload condition where the sensation of the ground on their foot is causing them to be a toe walker, but when they wear shoes, things normalize, that would be an excellent situation where I would say, yeah, wear shoes because that's, that's the path of least resistance for a child where skilled intervention is a little bit difficult. 
Um, in, in general, without any sort of sensory or neurologic condition, tone management, things like that, you know, if you have somebody that has cerebral palsy and also a bleeding disorder and they have to be in AFOs, obviously they have to wear shoes. Um, but in the general public, walking without shoes, it allows their feet to um, develop that arch by kind of gripping onto the ground. It allows their toes to expand, um, increasing their base of support. Um, and, and it just allows for more, more, more mobility um, and proprioception. So they kind of say, okay, well, I'm standing on something and now it's tilting this way. I have to recorrect. Sometimes in shoes that can be minimized um, because the whole shoe reacts versus just the outside of the foot feeling something versus the inside of the foot. And so I would really recommend um, as a lot of um, time without footwear, especially in the house and things like that. If you're going on a playground with wood chips, you know, we don't, we don't want anything going in there, but you know, for the most part, um, being barefoot or just even with socks, um, I, I think would be the best kind of course of action when we're trying to really develop that foot. Wonderful talk. You asked a very sensitive question. We have a grant that has been rejected three times by NIH. Uh, and <laughs> it's in collaboration with the University of Southern California and, um, uh, and Children's Hospital, Tom Coates and uh, Michael Koo. Their groups and Michael Debon at Vanderbilt, they did a very large sleep study with plethysmography and everything. And what they found was that they could see, because Sickle cell disease pain is a little different. The VOC prediction, nobody can predict when it will happen. And that's the worst irony in that case. A kid is sitting in the school and suddenly develops this, has to be rushed to the hospital. So what they found was that it was related to, to differences in the rhythm. And um, uh, what do we call it? The word is slipping my uh, arousal. It's related to arousal. And so, so you have these waves going down on their EEG and then suddenly it drops. And then there is this whole gap and, and then it goes back up. And, and, and those who have that during the sleep, and it's important during the sleep, those who have that during the sleep, they develop a VOC the following day. So it is quite related and sleep apnea could be, you know, it would give the same kind of EEG response and on plethysmography. And, and they, they think that it can be acquired in real time. So we all put our heads together and we uh, wanted to do all these in mice in parallel to see if we can induce that sleeplessness or sleep and, and then look at those. And then uh, we have been looking at some pathways like orexin pathway, which is involved in sleep. And if we, and that is altered in these mice, that's what we found. So I, I don't know if that's a cause or consequence because as Nikki just said, you know, there's more sleep, less sleeplessness, more pain, more pain, more sleeplessness. So, so they are trying, they developed this mobile device, which can be hooked to the cell phones and, and they can wear it like a watch and this will monitor everything uh, related to their sleep and then they can with artificial intelligence decode it and uh, isolate the features that can predict pain or that can occur in pain. So it is a biomarker as it's a predictive biomarker but uh, NIH said that it should be a therapy outcome biomarker not a predictive biomarker. So they didn't entertain it. We've been rejected three times, so very proud of it. <laughs> Other biosoluble biomarkers on the basis of my studies, we are trying to see if we can group them together like with these proteases. The problem is that a lot of these are in the central nervous system and they do not correlate with the circulating biomarkers. So that's the other problem, like we looked at the serotonergic pathway in the brain. So that is impaired, the serotonergic and dopaminergic pathway. But then you look at the plasma cir circulating serotonin, it's increased. So that's the other issue when we deal with the central nervous system and pain, that finding soluble biomarkers is difficult. 
Um, and to go along with that, you know, the pain experience is a conscious experience. So if they can get to sleep, you know, they're, they're not experiencing pain. It's when they're in during their wakeful hours that, that then they have that pain response. Um, and so, um, a lot of times using non-pharmacological things like meditation and, and relaxation and, um, distraction and things like that are ways to get people to sleep so that they, they can have more pain-free time. Um, pain psychologists that I, I used to work with um, at a pain clinic, they would actually use biofeedback for objective data on heart rate, body temperature, breaths per minute, things like that. And so objective data of they're in this um, hyper aroused state. They have, um, you know, kind of that fight or flight response going on. There's markers associated with that, but those are more stress markers, not pain markers. But, you know, you can try to um, measure things that come because of pain. Again, like uh, cortisol levels or, um, or heart rate, respiratory rate. You can do um, a pressure. Um, like there's pressure gauges for the mechanical um, hyperalgesia that Dr. Gupta was talking about. Um, you can measure how much, um, how many pounds per pressure on a specific um, body part elicit the pain response. You can do some desensitization and then retest that for objective data regarding um, pain. So, you know, it's very subjective, but there are ways to kind of measure um, kind of the, the side effects of having pain objectively. last week that should pain assessment be one of the uh, important uh, uh, follow-up uh, for any clinical condition to be asked because sometimes people can just hurt you know because they are so uh, so so depressed with all that is going on and can't sleep and the pain feels more so it's also a perception based thing and in our study that we proposed and we have done uh, with this group is we tried hypnosis. And with hypnosis, we could see that the vasoconstriction, because hypnosis actually acts on the mind. And through the mind, we could control the vasoconstriction. So, it, so since whenever there is that change that I was telling you in the waves, um, there was also vasoconstriction. And this vasoconstriction could be relieved with hypnosis and thereby reducing the incidence of VOC or predicting that VOC can be reduced. So there was a, a systemic as well as the central nervous system interaction, which was guided through the brain during hypnosis. So as you suggested, those mind-body interventions can be helpful, but they can't be a cure-all. And we, we notice the frustration every day in clinic, right? We have all these adult patients that are going to pain clinics and they don't understand hemophilia pain. So at the end of the day, almost all our patients, they say, I don't want to go to the pain clinic anymore because they're not giving me anything new. And all I want, they, 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 they say that marijuana helps the most and that's what they will do. And they're reluctant to even take care of the pain anymore and say, this is what we'll continue doing. And now when you talk about long-term effects and complications that you could have with marijuana, they're not ready to accept that because they don't have another alternative. And like you said, we should definitely start looking at pain as a, just like we talk to our sickle cell patients, I feel like um, that is not part of our comprehensive visit. I feel like pain is uh, not, we should consider pain as a vital sign and start talking about it um, in, at every visit and maybe that'll help us recognize it better. And the other problem is once it becomes chronic, it's very difficult to treat. So if we can um, do it in the primordial stage early on, then it may be easier to control it and not let it become, not get into central sensitization where the system is on an, on an autopilot and the chronic pain is refractory to all treatments. Yeah, that's a very good question, which cytokines? So we have selected a panel of about 11 cytokines that we look at and several of them are altered in the pain states in sickle cell disease. And those are the ones we are actually going to analyze in the hemophilia pain model that we have developed. And two of these are very prominent, like IL-6 and TNF-alpha. 
And TNF alpha is very can be very important for hemophilia because in arthritis TNF alpha is increased, and Enteracep, which targets TNF alpha, is being clinically used a, for osteoarthritis, and it's about the joints. So it's likely uh, that some of these can be utilized. And, and, and this panel of 11 cytokines we have published in many papers, but I'll be very glad to send them. And it includes RANTIS, GMCSF, IL-6, IL-3. And one will have to also look at the mouse model and see what all is, is different than what we have already analyzed in different pain conditions, actually. But it will be very important to actually start analyzing cytokines in the plasma. And these can be done as an array, so one doesn't have to do individuals. So with the same, you know, it's like send 100 microliter plasma and you can get all the answers for all 11 or 24 cytokines. So that may be the way to go with this. And the other molecule is substance P, which is released by the nerve fibers, as I described. And before we found it in the mouse with the mechanism of mast cells, actually somebody had published in blood a very nice paper from, um, in blood from uh, UPenn. For some reason, in 1990s, they looked at substance P for some reason. And they found it was increased in, at steady state in sickle cell patients in the circulation compared to controls. And it was further elevated with VOC. And substance P, what its role is now, we know that it initiates pain. It also maintains the chronicity of pain. And it also participates in neurogenic inflammation, which can cause swelling. And uh, you know that um, uh, dactylus we see in sickle cell patients, where the, where the digits are swollen and red, it could be contributing to that. So substance P would be a very good marker as well. I have a microphone. There's actually a patient who's the only one that I know of. Thank you. It's an ongoing clinical trial of um, pain in hemophilic arthropathy, utilizing a highly, highly selective and highly potent non steroidal anti inflammatory, which is markedly different than what's, what's on the market and available today, right? Um, and given the conversation around the, the, the inflammatory of pain associated with hemophilic arthropathy, sickle cell, et cetera, it may be useful to, to, for the group to know anyway that this pan-anti-inflammatory may not target just a single cytokine, or other, but, but, but actually many, right? Um, and, and so therefore, it might be useful for, for folks to know that. Is that the study using the, the drug that was available to the general public and then they took it off the market because of the um, cardiovascular? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that study is actually something we offer to the patients that come into our pain clinic um, because, um, you know, with the patients with bleeding disorder, you know, their chance of the cardiovascular risk associated with some of those NSAIDs um, is a little bit lower than the general population. And so those aren't the side effects that we're worried about with our population specifically. And so it could be a really good option for hemophilia specific um, because again, we're not worried so much about the cardiovascular effect that they saw in the general public, which again is similar to other um, products in that same family of NSAIDs. And so um, that is something that we offer for our patients in the pain clinic is to join that study um, and um, try that as a pain relieving method um, instead of what we kind of typically recommend, which is something that's not in a study, but just Celebrex um, is the other and said that, that we kind of offer as a kind of a conservative management. But that study is something that we offer to our patients. Can you tell us about a little more about this, who is the PI, so that if anybody in the audience wants to contact them, they can contact them. 
this will be very helpful. And secondly, if it doesn't have to be in a suspense, uh, what is this pan anti-inflammatory? Sure, it's, it's known as rofecoxib. Is it working now? Yeah, okay, sorry. So it's, it's, known, as, uh, it's known as rofecoxib. Uh, it was marketed rofecoxib. many years ago um, and, and then, and then uh, removed from the marketplace. Yeah. It has a very, it, it now has uh, orphan indication for hemophilic arthropathy, um, des orphan designation, not an indication, designation for HA uh, by the FDA. So it's recognized to be a potential treatment that avoids opioids, which is, which is important, right? But can still manage, manage the pain um, associated. There was, uh, there was a pilot study done many years ago illustrating that it had been effective um, this indication was never pursued until recently, so it's probably important to know that. The other two aspects of the medication that are different than Celebrex is that, one, it doesn't uh, uh, alter platelet aggregation, which is going to be important for anybody with a bleeding disorder. And the second thing is that it has a reduced G, uh, uh, GI risk than other NSAIDs, right? And so that's also an important aspect of this medication for this particular population. The, um, the, the I, I know I know the group uh, in there's a group in, in um, California in Stanford that's actually uh, looking at GI risk in, in in people with hemophilia and there's about a fourfold increase in risk for GI complications compared to the general population. So any other NSAID you might consider may contribute to that risk, where this this may obviate that. So there's a really there's a number of attributes that might be useful for you know your patients you know who want to be enrolled in such a study. Bruno. Thank you. Thank you. That was thank you Thanks. for all the information. Just to dovetail on that, so it's something really fascinating about these COX two inhibitors is that uh, so there is an inflammatory driver to osteophytogenesis. So the actually are arthropathies that provoke all kinds of pain and keep the chronicity going and alter the hemarthropathic landscape of an incongruous joint that constantly results in these osteophytic changes and potentially microfractures of these tissues as people are walking on <laughs> and load bearing on this, on this pathology. So the interesting thing in the biological sciences is that we're showing, they're showing, uh, at least in mouse models and in our, in arthritic in mice, <laughs> you, are, you can actually uh, head off the uh, osteophytogenesis. So this is a real potential avenue to investigate. So this is a, so not only just a, yes, we want to reduce the inflammatory drivers. Well, why? Um, another feature is actually maybe, maybe preventing uh, uh, these horrible changes that happen in the joints. That's a very, very nice uh, suggestion, Bruno. Uh, with, with the rofecoxib, we did some studies earlier on with COX-2 activation and COX-2 inhibition in, in uh, transgenic mice with cancer pain. And uh, what we also found was that by reducing the amount of COX-2 inhibitor, of course, we used Celebrex, um, uh, that we could also bring down the ED50 of opioids. So with a much lesser amount of opioid and a much lesser amount of COX-2 inhibitor, we could ameliorate uh, pain to a much larger extent with one or the other alone with a high amount. And the reason is that in the central nervous system, Pat Mantai and many others had shown many years ago uh, when they also showed that NGF nerve growth factor is in, important and it's released in these conditions when you have more osteoclastogenesis and it, uh, it causes pain. And, and, and COX-2 in the spinal cord is increased in pain. And it also leads to the generation of prostaglandins, which are the cause for pain. So I think it can have a dual effect. It would also inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis and also uh, bring down inflammation, but could be combined. And if there's a concern about its effect on bone, then to bring down the amount with co-treatment, because what is happening is we are always thinking of monotherapies. We should think of combined therapies so that the effect of one is not too toxic. 
or metronomic, do one for a few days and then the other for a few days. So these are some of the things we are trying, but it's slow. And as I said, NIH keeps grounding us. in a significantly lower risk of fractures than placebo among generally healthy midlife and older adults who are not selected for vitamin D deficiency, low bone mass, or osteoporosis. Any thoughts? Thank you. That's a great idea. And if I get more funding, I would absolutely do that. <laughs> Good answer. Um, yeah. Um, and then one more for Nikki is, uh, in an infant that is starting to pull up, how can I know if his joints... Um, now, how can I know if he's doing it correctly and if his joints are okay? Or what exercises are recommended to help his joints? And so usually between six months and 12 months is when um, the, our, our kids will start to go from sitting to crawling to kind of trying to pull up on things like that. Um, at that such a young age, we're not, the bones are not um, in their final place. The bones are not um, mature by any sense of the imagination. We really don't have to worry about at that specific moment, you know, um, doing any sort of joint damage from very um, typical developmental tasks like pulling up onto a coffee table or, you know, pulling up onto a couch or something like that. Um, it would be more of the traumatic um consequences of that being an unsuccessful attempt at developmental um, uh, progression. So usually what we worry about more is when they start to the pull, going out to the pull up, um, pulling up phase is what happens when they fall down. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of more um, uh, of what we per, um, educate on and what we kind of try to protect from is kind of those hematomas of falling on a toy car or falling on a block after that unsuccessful pull up. Um, so we're not really worried about the joints being injured at that time, um, just from the um, child's own body weight pulling up against something. Things that we wouldn't recommend for any child at that age would be kind of the swinging from, um, you know, kind of doing that um, swinging, holding onto the hands, and then kind of doing that, going around in a circle. That's just not good for any um, young child's bones, especially ones that are not mature and can easily um, subluxate and things like that. So um, I don't think that there's anything that you have to do in addition for um, somebody, you know, six months, 12 months, 16 months that has hemophilia any differently than you would do with somebody who does not have a bleeding disorder. One second, one second. Just so you know, all know, we have people online that want to hear the questions. First of all, thank you to the panel for sharing all your information. Uh, this question is uh, a little bit wider. I would like to hear the panel's experience uh, with arthropathy in patients with VWD. Uh, if you have encountered uh, these patients, if you've seen any bone health issues towards these patients, thank you. Um, among patients that I've seen, I've had a few patients who have had recurrent, uh, recurrent fractures. We've we now have a patient who literally has a bleed every week. He's a type 3 1 Wilbrin on prophylaxis. Um, so depending on the severity, they do their joint health is definitely affected. Um, in our study, we did find that osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and fractures are all significantly higher in one Wilbrin disease. So, and we don't know the exact mechanisms yet. It's probably thrombin generation. We don't know, but patients with one Wilbrin disease are definitely at a higher risk than general population. Um, some of the experience that I've seen is in von Willebrand's that's diagnosed late in life. Um, it's only because something bad happened that then they figured out what, um, what was causing 
all these kind of weird symptoms growing up. So we have um, a, a gentleman in his 40s, and he found out he had Von Willebrand after an injury playing college football. Things that we don't typically recommend for our patients, but if you don't know you have it, you don't know what to look out for. Um, and so we had, um, you know, many injuries over time. You know, he just thought he was a slow healer and things like that. And so at this time, now he's got the arthropathy that we would see, you know, as common as we would see in hemophilia A and B. We see, we're seeing very similar presentations, similar HJHS scores with the crepitus and the joint capsule swelling, um, pain and, and atrophy and things like that. And so it's, it's, I'm seeing it more in our late diagnosis patients, you know, ones that didn't know and they did all the things that we would educate them about early on that they didn't know not to do. And that's where I see it in our Von Willebrand's patients is um, just the, the lack of diagnosis and the lack of education that someone would get if they got diagnosed earlier. Okay, this question's for Nikki. How often do you utilize the DEXA scan for assessment on bleeding disorder patients? And what is the utility of the use of DEXA scans in pediatric populations? So personally, as a physical therapist, I never utilize a DEXA scan. Um, that's just one thing that when we talk about our annual comprehensive visit, we're talking all ends of the spectrum. And so usually, um, like Dr. Sitlow was talking about, you know, there's indications for DEXA scans over time and who would qualify, you know, insurance has to pay for it. So there has to be an indication. Um, in our younger patients um, without bleeding disorders, that's usually where I see patients that have had cancer and lots of chemotherapy, um, and then they're going to have bone mineral density changes because of that, but not necessarily in our um, hemophilia population until a study gives us an indication that we need to be monitoring it from a much younger age. Um, but as a physical therapist um, and as one person as part of a team, it's just nice to know going in um, what somebody, you know, maybe we have um, a hemophilia A carrier, um, you know, factor eight is 40% though. So now we have some symptomatic bleeding. Um, we've had some traumatic bleeding in the, in the past. And I really do want to know what her bone um, health is before I start doing resistance exercises. I don't want to cause a fracture that causes a bleed that then, you know, not only sets back our treatment, but then adds another problem onto the list. Yeah, so we recently did a survey of all HTCs in the country to see how many people are actually doing DEXA scans. Out of the 40 centers that responded, only six centers are actually doing DEXA scans for patients. And majority of these, out of the six, I think, nine centers are doing it, six are adult centers, and three are combined adult and pediatric centers. So DEXA is not being widely used overall. Um, and in pediatrics, there. In, in adults, at least, we have these indications of when to do it. In pediatrics, there, there was a consensus statement that came out from the Society of Endocrinology a couple of years back, which lists all the conditions. And hemophilia and thalassemia are listed under bleeding disorders that may need monitoring. So typically, in our case, we've had a one Willebrand patient who had two fractures back to back. And we had to send, we sent that patient to endocrinology for a workup and ended up needing a DEXA scan. But again, fracture is an end result of poor bone mineral density. We have to identify these things early. So if a patient's having recurrent joint bleeds and having arthropathy and having mobility issues, that should be an indication to start screening these patients early and intervene so that it doesn't, they don't go on to have recurrent fractures in the future. Yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty similar to an x-ray, but I'm not 100% sure. I would have to look that up. But the benefits of screening and treating it far outweighs the small risk if you, you are exposed to radiation if you go on an airplane and um, several other things. So, But I don't think we're there yet to start screening them. Right. 
question? Uh, so this is for Dr. Nikki. Um, with an adult who is suffering from pronation of the, uh, the ankle joint, um, would it be beneficial like it is for uh, the youth, uh, particularly the child, um, to walk barefoot or without a shoe anyway? Um, yeah. Um, so the age of a child, you know, a one-year-old child versus a 14-year-old child, that would definitely be a consideration. So um, depending on how old the child is, um, developmental pronation is a phase that we get into until we have formal, normalized formal gait. And so it just kind of depends on where they are without knowing that specific patient and without assessing, is the pronation causing them problems? Again, if it's not bothering them, I'm not going to jump in and fix something that's not broken. Um, and so if we have somebody who's, you know, under 10 years old, I would still like to see that foot develop a little bit more um, without, um, without intervention. You know, there's a lot of physical therapy exercises you can do for intrinsic muscle strengthening, um, ankle strengthening, and things like that, that would be more beneficial than putting a um, arch support or a cor like a pronation correction heel cup or um, any sort of orthotic in the shoe um, that because the orthotic will take the place if the foot doesn't have to hold up the arch, it's not going to, you know, so what happens is when you take that shoe off or that orthotic off and now you're barefoot and standing in the bathroom, um, you know, you're going to have that same collapse. And so if we can strengthen the muscle that holds that arch up, that's a much better long-term solution. Um, you know, but again, how old is the child? Is it bothersome at this time? Um, you know, is there anything else affecting that, um, that foot? Do they have low tone? Um, something that strengthening might not be able to affect as much. Um, so there, there's a lot of um, complex factors. And so if you ever have a concern, you can always refer to a physical therapist and say, hey, the, these feet look um, like they might use intervention and you can always have somebody, you know, specializing in that to just take a look at it and let you know, yeah, this is something I would intervene on or no, this is something that, um, you know, is kind of developmental, developmentally normal. Um, I would definitely, in my clinic, I would definitely def defer to our gait specialist, physical therapist, um, Dr. Roy Ball, who is doing our gait study. She, you know, if I have a question, I would always, you know, refer out to her because she's the encyclopedia on developmental gait patterns and things like that. And so again, if I, if I'm not sure, I'll just refer out to a specialty or a specialist that would have a little bit more, um, you know, knowledge in that area. Always ask your physical therapist. <laughs> Uh, DEXA scans, like an x-ray, way lower dose. So just to lay fears. Dr. Nikki would like to know that with the 53-year-old the uh, with the dorsiflexion limitation, did you guys do any imaging and what did you select? And did you use point of care muscus? Thanks. Can you just repeat that? Sorry, I did not hear that all the way. Your case report? Yes. The 53-year-old with a range of motion limitation and dorsiflexion, I believe it was minus three. And then after doing some manual therapies, it went up to eight degrees. I'm wondering, you didn't mention any imaging studies. I was just, uh, did you select any imaging studies? Did you do any? And uh, did you also check uh, with uh, point of care muscus? I know you guys use it at, at Denver. Uh, if you can just comment. Thanks. Of course. So by the time that I um, came into her care um, as a team member, she had already had imaging of the ankle. Um, originally, when the pain started in 2016, it was imaged with x-ray um, and they, you know, showed there's some um, arthritis, you know, very typical of hemophilic arthropathy with osteophytes and, and all sorts of different changes that we see specifically with bleeding related joint changes. Um, and then the pain did not get better with conservative management originally, you know, just the exercises, resting, icing. So then she had an MRI. So when I got into the picture, I already had that imaging available. If not, I would have 100% sent her for imaging just because the presentation, anytime you have a contracture, I want to know if it's a flexible contracture or if it's a fixed contracture. You don't want to be jamming into an ankle that's not going to move no matter what. Um, and so the imaging showed that there was some fixed um, 
you know, some fixed contractor. So she's not going to get full, you know, 22 degrees of dorsiflexion um, or, in, you know, anything like that. Um, but there was some mobility. The joint um, surfaces weren't fused yet. There is room to move. There just wasn't a lot of room to move. And so that's why something like a manual distraction that puts traction on the joint creates a little bit more space. And then you can do that mobilization, um, you know, kind of stabilizing the tibia and then moving the talus. Um, kind of on that. And that's where we got a lot of our, um, our joint mobility from, and then kind of making sure the soft tissues are, are, um, extending with that. So if you have somebody with an ankle, um, fusion or really restricted tissues, the Achilles tendon is going to be super tight. That's not something that's going to stretch out in one day, one week, one month. Um, that's going to take time to have everything kind of have that length tension relationship that we want or is ideal for that patient. Follow up on the manual therapy technique. Uh, do you find that with the manual therapy techniques and the distraction that there's actually with a, with a chronically inflamed synovium, do you feel like there's a de decongestive um, element to the actual technique? In other words, it's great for the circulation of that synovium. And uh, is there something that, that helps with the pain on that mechanism as well? Anecdotally, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't, there's, I don't know if there's research out there that's showing that, but when you have an ankle that really doesn't move very well, you don't have that muscle pump, um, from the foot, from the calf, especially this is specific to the ankle, but you don't have that muscle pump to kind of, um, clear out some of that inflammation, some of that dependent edema. And so by giving it some tractive traction, giving it some mobility, um, you know, and then allowing some of that, um, kind of inflammation soup as, as we call it in, in the pain neuroscience wor world, but trying to get some of that to move again, when I also do it, I'm doing it in an elevated position. Um, so I'm not having them have their legs hanging over the, um, treatment table. I'm having them lay down and having that leg kind of in a relaxed position. And so, um, you know, is there a gravity component to it from being elevated? Is there a traction, um, kind of soft tissue mobilization that's pushing some of that, um, lymphatic fluid out? possibly anecdotally i see that um sometimes there is an acute reaction that is actually more inflammatory um, by stretching things that haven't been stretched but nothing that some you know an ice pack or something like that after a therapy session um shouldn't uh shouldn't be able to kind of uh reduce All the assessments, uh, people have to come into the clinic. Is there, are there any efforts to do monitoring for gait which can be done remotely with the cell phones and biosensor technology where they can wear a sensor and the movement can be recorded for their feet? And then using, we, we use this for mice with artificial intelligence and we can, correlate the changes in their gait with stance and other factors, multiple factors um, with uh, hypersensitivity, particularly in musculoskeletal hyperalgesia in sickle mice. We published that a year ago, so I did not describe it, but uh, there are these biosensors like in little buttons, which can be put on the foot, uh, in the shoe or worn on the ankle and maybe it is time for us to think about advancing technology in acquiring some of these on a regular basis so that you no know, because sometimes what happens is particularly from sickle i've learned that when their pain starts they don't want to go to the er or to the clinic and then it's just beyond control and then they are hospitalized and so i'm just wondering in real time to get monitor these changes uh, is something in the pipeline somewhere um i i would not know that i do not claim to be a gate expert by any means and so i think some of the gate colleagues would definitely be a good resource our study is actually looking at what are we trying to change if we don't know the difference between a control and not a control or someone with hemophilia and a control we don't know what to monitor we don't know what to modify so if somebody wants to create an at-home monitoring sensor biofeedback while we're getting all this done go right ahead and let us know somebody should do it right yeah <laughs>